Today's Below the Frame, we're talking with Sesame Street and Disney Muppet performer Peter Lintz. Peter and I talk about how he was in the right place at the right time and found himself working on Sesame Street and with the Muppets. We'll also be talking a bit about live hands. So put both of those hands together. It's time to go Below the Frame. Go, go, go Below the Frame. Welcome to Below the Frame where we go in-depth with my friends who work in the Muppet universe or just happen to be Muppet performers for Sesame Street and the Muppets. And uh, we also talk a bit about what you should be doing if this crazy career is something that you can see yourself doing someday. I am your host, Matt Vogel. And uh, if you don't already know, I happen to be a Sesame Street and Disney Muppet performer myself. And I am ready for today's show. So I'm going to jump right in. Are, Are you ready? Let's do it. Let's go below the frame. frame. Joining me today is a good friend of mine. He is one of the core Sesame Street and Disney Muppet performers who has worked on nearly every puppet production that has been shot over the last 30 years. He's played prominent roles on shows like uh, The Puzzle Place, Blues Room, Aliens in the Family, Between the Lions, Book of Pooh, Blues Room, It's a Big, Big World, Lomax the Hound of Music, 30 Rock, Scooby-Doo Adventures, and in films like Muppets from Space... And many, many more. He played Tutter on Bear in the Big Blue House. And so that's where I'm still working on your intro. But in the end, oh, yeah. it's going to link you left off, beautifully. You, you left off Pet Cemetery too. Oh, my God. We'll have to talk about that. But <laughs> in the, at the end of the intro, I will link beautifully into what I'm about to say now. It's Peter Lintz. Hi, Peter. Hi, Matt. Hey, thank you so much for joining me. Well, you know, it was tough to fit you in. I'm awfully busy these days. <laughs> I know. I had well, a lot going on today, but I, I, you know what, I, was, I, found, I managed to eke out a little bit of time. I really appreciate that. You know, Peter, we are friends, correct? You can say that, right? Would you um, say that? Would you please, I, just for me, I, even if it's just for me, wouldn't you say it? Yeah, I'd, I'd, account, I'd count you among okay. one, of, one of my best friends, okay, actually. Good, I, good. I, okay. I love you very much, my Google. I'm not I ashamed to say it. I, I've not, known you for I years. I, know, I knew you when you were a pupa. And, uh, oh, <laughs> ew. <laughs> well, you well, got better. Uh, yeah, good. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to pretend that I don't know anything about you, or at least I'm going to try that I don't. Well, you know, i got to ask questions. I'm, my, it's my job to ask the questions. And um, so I'm going to start by saying, where did young Peter Start life. Where did you grow up? Tell tell me where I you grew, up. grew up in Decatur, Georgia. Is that basically a suburb? unincorporated? It's a suburb of Atlanta, but it's so it's really in, it's Atlanta. It's engulfed by it Atlanta. Um, I was actually born in Michigan, uh, oh. but uh, and my family lived there till I was three, and then they moved to Georgia. But I, but I found them anyways. And uh, <laughs> they uh, yeah. my my mother is a native yeah. Atlantan, going back phew, several generations, and uh, she couldn't stand the cold. So uh, she, they moved yeah. back to Georgia. Anyway, I have, I have fleeting memories of Michigan. But um, so, yeah, I count Atlanta as my hometown. And, and tell me your family. You're not an only child. I am not an only child. I'm, I'm one of four. Uh, I was the oops baby. Um, <laughs> the story, yeah. I, I have, I have uh, well, I, I had two brothers and one sister. My, my eldest brother uh, died about four years ago. Mm. Um, yeah, so uh, my, my siblings were age 15, 13, and 10 when Ooh, I came and along. And you. And that then is me. an oops baby. Well, the story in the family goes that they're all sitting around the dinner table. And my father says, kids, uh, your mother and I have something to tell you. You're going to have a new uh, baby brother or baby sister. And I believe it was my eldest brother who stopped eating and said, did you have to tell us while we were eating? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was my, disgusting. Uh, and my, my other brother <laughs> would uh, always embarrass me in, in front of uh, whenever I brought a girl home to the house, especially when I was a teenager. It's like, he would go around saying, I used to have to wipe your behind. Oh, man. <laughs> but usually the youngest is, the, I mean, the it's the baby. You're the baby. I was, I, people, yeah, did they I got, take care of you and were you treated yeah, like the baby otherwise? Definitely. Well, I had two mothers. I had my mother and then I had my big sister. Ah, that's great. Um, so I, I grew up with two moms. And yeah, I was the little golden child. And uh, Yeah. What, um, did your, what did your parents do? My father, ugh, everything. Um hmm. When I came along, he was the associate director of the counseling center at Georgia State University. He was also um, uh, he had a doctorate in psychology. He had a private practice for clinical psychology mm. on the side. 
before I came along, <laughs> he had a, a master's in electrical engineering from Georgia Tech. Um, he was in the army for a little while. He went to the seminary, became an Episcopal minister, and liked the counseling aspect so much of, of the ministry that he went and got his doctorate in psychology. He so was, he's a sl- he was a slouch. Yeah, he, did he was not a bum. Do My father was a bum. Wow, that is an impressive he resume of things that he did. He was a, a mensch, and he was Gosh. sent over on a boat from Nazi Germany. They were he was Jewish, and uh, oh. his parents sent him on a boat. I think he was. I'm gonna get this. I think he was 11. He might have been nine. And my grandfather was um, in a concentration camp early in the war. He was able to get out. But oh. anyway, Thank there's you. my dad and my mother is so many different things. She's a master gardener. Uh, She was, she went to college later in life. She got a degree in computer programming, none of which is all completely obsolete now because it was like the seventies and early Um, eighties. She's very artistic. She plays recorder. She sang in choir for years. Um, She paints, she can sew anything. She's a hooker. My mom's a hooker. Uh, rug rug right. hooking, of course. Rug right? Hooking. Yes, I knew. No, I knew that. She's very proud to say that she's a hooker. <laughs> she took. She's taken yeah. classes in wood carving. Um, so another very point. lazy person. Yeah, just total with bum. My no mom. interests and at all. She, she, my mom is a week away from turn. I don't know when you're gonna, when this is going to come out, but she's uh, right. about to turn ninety one. Still lives oh in the gosh. same house I grew up in. She's been in that house for gosh over fifty years. Uh, she has a personal trainer she works out with twice a week. Another two days a week she does Tai Chi, and then on the weekends she'll go hiking if it's not too hot. So, Peter, tell me a little bit about what did um, you do as a kid? <laughs> not watch nearly as much TV as I wanted. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, growing up in the 70s, I, I was, oh, oh, man, I loved me some sitcoms. I loved me some Mary Tyler Moore and oh. Bob Newhart. MASH, oh, my gosh, I was raised Mash. on MASH. Yeah. Brady Bunch. Loved Brady you know, Bunch. Oh, and the cartoons. Forget it. Saturday morning mm-hmm. cartoons back when they were Saturday morning Only cartoons. on Saturdays. Yeah. 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 Uh, and Mr. Rogers and Sesame Street and anything mm-hmm. puppet related. And my mother, mom did not like to see me watching so much TV. So why don't you go outside and play? Right. So there was a lot of going outside and playing. There was a lot of kids in the neighborhood. At least when I was a little kid, as I got older, people moved away and it became one of those older neighborhoods. It was like, it was a baby boomer neighborhood. You know, mm. my siblings are all baby boomers. Right. And then I come along a Gen Xer. So it was an aging neighborhood. But I had a, a best, my best friend, Drew, well, of course, I still I still keep up with, and uh, his dad was an Episcopal priest as well, <laughs> and uh, we would hang out all the time. Yeah, we could a lot of sleepovers. What'd you do? Like, we dam up the creek. There's a little creek that runs through the backyard. Yeah, and the, the the banks are all clay, and there, there's a lot of rocks, and we would take the rocks and clay and dam up the creek, and then we would get these models. We'd save up our allowance and buy uh, these plastic model ships. And we'd assemble them. And as we were building them, we'd take bottle rockets, snap off the wooden oh. part of the stick, put the little dynamite piece in different parts of the ship and have the little wick sticking out. Then we'd have the creek all dammed up. And then we'd put the ship and float it on this beautiful little pond that we, <laughs> mini yeah. pond we'd yeah, created. Yeah. And then we'd light one end on fire and wait for the fire to reach the firecrackers <laughs> and the ship would explode. <laughs> That's really cool. <laughs> that sounds like fun. Were the, were the models the snap together models or did you no, have to glue them? No, no, they because, were the glue, the glue kind. So that's some, a lot of time that you spent a lot to of time. Then destroy my, them. My, it, it perplexed my mother to no end. She could not. <laughs> hey, figure. but you know what? They you were outside. Hours. You were outside. We were outside. We weren't watching. We you weren't. Were, listen, you know. We, so <laughs> I, I heard you mention just a little bit. You mentioned Sesame Street there. You mentioned Mr. Rogers and Sesame yeah. Street. So I'm going to guess that Sesame Street is kind of what brought you to puppetry. Ultimately, it did. Part of my childhood, I kept out. Uh, my earliest puppet memory was when I was in preschool and uh, at Lulwater, uh, Emory University. And there was uh, a little squirrel puppet. I think it was a little stife puppet. It was a really nice mohair oh, squirrel. Yeah, yeah. And I was, I was kind of shy. When I put this little squirrel on my hand, I mean, distinct. I must have been four or five years old. I distinctly remember being able to make the other kids laugh with the antics that I would come up with this for, with this squirrel. And when I had this squirrel on, it was completely fearless. There was no social awkwardness. There was no mm-hmm. shyness at all. And I loved the feeling that I got when I made these kids laugh with this little squirrel puppet. And and then and then of course Sesame Street. Boy, I mean, I watched Sesame Street way after it was age appropriate, <laughs> and and was teased mercilessly yeah. for it. Uh. uh but still, 
<laughs> but you <laughs> didn't stop me. Did. And now, why did you watch? Were you watching, uh, you know, you knew your alphabet. I was watching Jim Henson, Frank Oz, Jerry Nelson, Richard Hunt, Carol Spinney. And I was, yeah, I was, oh, the comedy. I was watching yeah. the comedy routines. The Bert and Ernie and Grover and Cookie Monster, who was my favorite growing up, and Kermit the Frog. Mm. Man, I loved it. And being a child of the 70s, you know, those TV shows, there was always a father figure who was often put upon and never loved his work. Mm-hmm. Always hated. George Jefferson, oh. Right, yeah, yeah. Hated his job. Um, Fred Flintstone. Yeah. Oh, my Who gosh. Just to, to go that? to Mr. Slate. Oh, I gotta go to work. <laughs> you know. Um, and that got me thinking as, as a kid. I must have, somewhere between 8 and 10, I started thinking yeah. about it because, like, Eight and ten, it's like you, you are almost an adult. I mean, it's right, right there. of course, and you need to be making those career decisions now. It's yeah, now, man, it's so close. It's all these dads on TV, these uh, these role models mm-hmm. who hated their jobs, and I was like, well, when I grow up, I I want to have a job that I love that that can support me, but but I like to go to work. And it's like, well, what <laughs> what what job would that be? And it took me, you know. A fraction of a second is, oh, well, I'm, I want to be a puppeteer with the Muppets. I want to work with Jim. I want to be a puppeteer on Sesame Street. That'll do it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> a very, you know, that's, and that's that beauty of innocence of being a child of saying, well, that, that is what I want to do. That's what I'm going to do. My kids are like, I want to be a professional baseball player. <laughs> you know, it's these maybe things they will that be. we, maybe they will. But these things that we aspire to when we are little ones, you know, they are often, we don't have that curse of knowing what life is really like what the real world is really like yeah you know? oh, yeah. like how yeah. hard it is you know it's funny it's funny to say things. that another wonderful puppeteer tyler bunch his father used to teach acting and he would say i'm going to probably get the quote wrong but this, he would say to his acting students you know if you, day one if you can imagine yourself making a living doing anything other than acting if you can imagine it get out <laughs> yeah and you couldn't imagine yourself doing anything other than being a well puppeteer. for a short time i could my senior year of high school, there was all this really big on standardized tests in 1985, apparently. And, uh, mm. you know, there's all these aptitude tests, see what you were good at. And people were going off to school. And I thought, well, maybe I could be like my dad. I'll get a degree in psychology and I could still do puppets. I could do puppets with family therapy. Sure, that's a thing with mm-hmm. puppets. But then it, it took me less than three years to figure out that that was wrong. <laughs> that was yeah, wrong but, for me. But you did go. You went to college. I went to, yeah, I went to and University you studied. of Georgia. Uh, and I studied. I did study psychology. But psychology and a bachelor's degree is pretty much useless. Yeah. Um, but about halfway through my junior year, I was like, uh, again, adulthood looming on the horizon, like when uh-huh. I was eight. Yep. And like, I don't want to do this. This doesn't bring me joy. I want to I wanna play with dolls on TV and movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my parents were very supportive. They they're, they said, "Well, okay, that's fine, but you should finish college just so you can show potential employers that you can finish what you start." It's like, okay, and since makes sense, I was in the rarefied position of having them pay for it. Um, so who am I to argue with that? So I know, um, right? Yeah. So they supported you. They supported this decision yeah. of their son wanting to yeah. go off and play with dolls on TV yeah. and in movies. Good luck, son. They, yeah, miraculously, yeah. They were my. This is the thing about being the youngest of four, especially with so much time in between. My parents had three other kids to break <laughs> them in, break in, break them in right. on their parenting. So when I came along, they were the most laid back, supportive, <laughs> just the Whatever nicest, you do. kindest people. But my oldest brother had it really, oh, really tough. My mom used to say, "We used to make Christopher make his bed every day. You don't know how good you've got it." <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> So you finished college, mm-hmm. you got a BA in psychology, right? <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. And, and then what did you do? Did you just, I'm going to move to New York now? No, hardly, hardly. I uh, I wanted to get a job with the Muppets. So okay. during my senior year, I made a, <laughs> I hired a guy from the film department to video, you know, <laughs> little compact videotapes were not really a thing yet. And mm-hmm. I had to hire this guy to come and, and record on three quarter inch tape, not even VHS, wow. but three quarter inch. Okay. Because that's what they use in the industry. Yeah. And I set up a little puppet stage. I must have made out a cardboard box in the living room of the house, living room of the house I was living in. And I did an abbreviated version. You know, I totally left off my puppet shows as a kid. I used to do yeah. puppet shows all the time. Did you? I did. I completely left off that part. Well, 
well, just tell me about them now, and then we'll come. And I'll remember. We'll come back to this thing where you. So you, this was not your first puppet experience making oh this video. Oh my goodness, so hardly. No, I did, you... I did puppets. I was so into my, my parents would. Buy, I'd get puppets as gifts. People would make me puppets. Uh, I did take a puppet building course along with my mom at the Center for Puppetry Arts. I was too young to take the course, but they they agreed if she took it with me that it would be okay. And I yeah. was just terrible. I was the worst puppet builder. I have no patience for puppet building, right. and a tremendous amount of respect for the people that do it. I just, I just want to play with the dolls. Mm-hmm. I, I, I just want it to be done so I can perform it and give yes. it a character. But you as know? a kid, you were making, you were doing puppet shows. I was doing for... puppet shows with uh, four neighborhood kids. I, I remember I was like seven, six, seven, eight, something like that, and a neighbor, a little, a little girl up the street, was turning four or five, and her parents were like Peter, would you? And they knew that I did puppet shows for the neighborhood kids all the time. My mom helped me build a, a stage. I had a little stage in the basement. Started yeah. out with the card as a cardboard box, and ultimately she she helped me build this nice wooden stage. And I said, oh sure. And so I did a puppet show for Kathleen Dempsey's birthday party, and the mom gave me a check. I mean, I mean an envelope. And I was like, oh okay. And she said, thank you so much, Peter. Bye. And I went home. I, I was walking back. They, they lived two doors up from us, and I'm walking down the street back to my house. And I opened up the envelope, and there were there were two five dollar bills in there oh. like what is that why did she do that mom <laughs> why did she do that she said well she you you worked she was paying you it's like yeah but i was having fun it wasn't work oh boy <laughs> yeah and so you were paid and then you I continued to that do was that. my first paid puppet show and i continued to do that uh there were little art festivals uh, in atlanta there was the piedmont park arts festival every summer and i would set out a suitcase and take a few of my best puppets with me and I would just do improv talking to people walking by and I'd put out a hat and, yeah. and these were puppets that you built no no I was a terrible builder these, build. were, these were gifts the, the, we would go to craft fairs uh, mm-hmm. every year there's the the um, Powers Powers Crossroads craft fair down in Noonan, Georgia around Labor Day weekend every year and there was a, a woman who built these great puppets there. And every year we went, my dad would buy me a different puppet oh. from this woman. And so I had a bunch of her stuff. And then I had the Fisher Price Sesame puppets. You know, I had Grover oh, yeah. and Cookie Monster and Oscar. Uh, I, I had the the line of the Sesame Street finger puppets, <laughs> and Ernie and Bert and Oscar yeah. and Cookie and Grover. And you kept doing this. You you I, kept doing puppet shows, and then all you, throughout elementary, high school. But then you set it aside, and then went to college, and you came back. And, and thought, I'm going to make a video for the Jim Henson Company. I need somebody to help me. I'm going to build a you know cardboard box. I'm going to take some puppets, and I'm going to make a And I'm going to do, do a little demo reel. And, I'm gonna, and what I did was I took some of the bits. My, my puppet show that I did was basically a variety show. It was based on The Muppet Show. Okay. What a surprise. Yeah. With different skits. Um, one terrible puppet that I did actually build was uh, uh, Sarah Smith. And Sarah Smith, I could actually crochet. I couldn't crochet anything except for a straight line. <laughs> okay. And I had this horrible green takes yarn. Talent. I don't know. And I crocheted a straight line, <laughs> a bunch of them, a bunch oh. of strands, and made hair for this puppet. I, it was like it was like Bo Derek and Ten. You know, she had this mm-hmm. crocheted hair. And then I attached a, a coat hanger wire on each end of the, 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 the hair. And I did this little bit. It was Sarah Smith and her dancing hair. Ah, uh, that's good. Simon Smith and his Cl- Very clever, though. And I had that's several other bits. Good. Anyway, yeah. So I put my little, I foreshortened my little bits, put them together, did this little puppet show, sent it off to to the producer Pat Nugent, mm-hmm. and I got the loveliest rejection letter. Oh. You know, this was before the internet, and yeah. I did not, and I did not know. Also, I wasn't very bright, but I did not know that the Muppets used monitors. Well. Yeah. I did how how could you have? No. I mean, what would have been there, there? A, now you you can just go online and oh, you can and if you, you want to know, you want to do this, you'd see it all you'd see it right away. But how would you know? I mean, you were no way of knowing that they did that. And uh she said, you know, your characters are great, your character voices are really strong, your puppetry is really good. But this is what we do, blah blah blah. Well, like, it was okay. nice that Pat did say, here's what we do. Oh yeah. No, it's a great letter. I still have it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a re- rejection letter as well. Oh, that's wonderful. Isn't that a great thing to have? Yeah, it is. From <laughs> Renee Rochelle. She wrote my Oh, that's sweet. So yeah. we're kind of like, you know, keep at it. Here's what we do. That's Crazy. wonderful. So you got this rejection. Letter. I got this rejection letter. And I was like, all right, okay. That was, that was, that was plan A. Plan B, uh, there was a company in North Carolina. Uh, it was Donald Devitt and Drew Allison, Gray Seal Puppets. And mm. I knew they did video puppetry. So I sent a tape to them. And they were they were lovely, and uh, eventually came around to well, we're not really hiring people right now. Why don't you try the Center for Puppetry Arts? 
So the Center for Puppetry Arts is in Atlanta, Georgia. It is the only place of its kind in the country. It's the only place that's solely dedicated, at least at the time, I don't know if this is still true, but it's solely dedicated to the art of puppetry. They had a world-class museum even back then um, and several different stages. They would put on family shows throughout the year. They had an adult experimental series. And uh, in 1989, they had a wonderful internship program. And my parents had mentioned the Center for Puppetry Arts, and I knew I knew it in the back of my head because I went there as a kid. I, I saw a production there when I was 11 years old. I saw Bruce Schwartz, hmm. who was a guest on The Muppet Show, do these yeah. amazing rod puppets, and his manipulation was glorious to watch. And uh, a friend of our family's had been taking a class with him, and so we were able to go not not just see him perform, but have coffee and, well, for me, you know, milk and coffee cookies <laughs> uh, after at their home and he brought oh. a couple of his puppets and let me perform them and he wrote in his in the little program good luck peter but you won't need it you're a natural bruce schwartz oh that's so like cool. 11 years old okay lovely aside anyway so gray seal said no muppet said no I said oh fine i'll apply to the center for puppetry arts best thing i could have done and so you were an intern there i was an intern there as were a great many other uh people of renown from that era actually and we will um, name them now. Well, there was... <laughs> uh, who was Ma- there? Mary, Mary Robinette Kowal. Oh, yeah. Who was a celebrated author. Yeah. Um, Robin Walsh, who was an animator. Yep. Uh, Alice Deneen, mm-hmm. the puppeteer with uh, Dark Crystal yeah. and many others. Oh, gosh, there's many more. Oh, gosh. Um, uh, Basil Twist. Oh, gosh, yeah. Was an intern during that time. Uh, Ron Binion. A lot of people. I know I'm leaving off people. I apologize people anyone that's were... listening to this that I'm leaving off. But there was there was a pile of us. And... There's a wonderful puppeteer in Atlanta named Peter Hart who was in charge of that program. And it was a three-month gig with no guarantee of employment afterwards. It's just to learn about all different types of puppetry from all over the world. Um, No guarantee you'd get to perform. But as luck would have it, they were doing a production of Gulliver and the Little People that fall. Mm -hmm. And they needed an extra puppeteer, so I actually got to perform. And I think actually Donald Devitt uh, directed that production, if I'm not mistaken. And you, so you were, I, you got a, you got a gig. I got a gig. I got it. And it you know, paid a little, a little weekly stipend, which was lovely. And after the internship was over, they actually had an opening in the museum for an assistant to the museum director. And so I was like, sign me up. So for the next six to eight months, that's what I did. I'd, you know, look after the collection and I'd give tours to school groups coming through. And that was a blast because I got to perform a little bit and, right. uh, and learn even more. And then, so after I'd been at the center nearly a year, uh, they were getting ready to mount a touring production of Pinocchio. And they held auditions, and I auditioned, and I got the lead as Pinocchio for a touring production to go all, all across the eastern half of the U.S. for eight months. That's a and long tour. Or it maybe is it's a long not tour. A, not... <laughs> but, that, <laughs> but that same summer, uh, they actually, and, and Jim, Jim died while I was a museum docent. That was during that period. But at the time, right before Jim died, they were starting to look for puppeteers in the South because the the original Disney deal was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And they thought they were going to have studios. Uh, it, it was At the time, it was called Disney MGM Studios down in Orlando. Yeah. What's it called now? It's just called the Disney's Hollywood Studios, I think. Okay. It's something like that. It was Disney MGM Studios back then. And, and uh, so they were looking for puppeteers in the South, basically Rolodex time. Okay, who do we have? Who's around that we can train? And... Uh, that summer, when I got the, the job with Pinocchio, uh, Steve Whitmire and Kevin Clash came to the center and auditioned a bunch of us. And <laughs> my friend Robin Walsh said, oh, they're coming. You should, you should sign up for it. Well, of course I'm signing up for it. And she said, they use monitors. I'm like, that kind of wrong about, wait, Uh-oh. wait, monitors. That's right. What does that mean? I'm coming over to your house. So she had a camera. <laughs> she hooked oh, it up my. to my parents' television. I had uh, that wonderful animal puppet yeah. that was yeah. with the eyebrow. Oh, mic. yeah, that's a great puppet. And so... We pra- and it's like, oh my god, this is so hard. It was the first time I'd ever had a puppet on my hand in front of a camera, looking at a monitor, and it was like, you know, at that point I'd been puppeteering my entire life. What was I, twenty two years old? Yeah, I was probably full of super confidence. Savvy, super full of confidence. I could, right. Yeah, it, it was it was awful. It was like I'd never touched a puppet in my life. And what did you think? Did you think, oh, I'm screwed? 
there is no way. Or did you think, no, I was I'm going to get this. I'm, I'm gonna get going this. to get this. And how that. long before before they were going to arrive at the pup, at the? It was just a few. Day. It was just a few days. Oh, it was gosh. a few days. We did not work that much on it. It was a couple of times maybe, and it was just kind of to rough it in. And I by no means had it anywhere close, but at least I had a notion of what it felt like. And Robin was the one who told me because she had been working on it. And she's like, your brain eventually makes the flip. It's like a switch, mm-hmm. and it's and you got it. And I was like, okay, and I just had to trust her on that. Yeah. But I credit her and that and that experience with how I did in the audition because I did get from that that first audition I did get invited to a 5-day workshop at Disney MGM Studios with Steve and Kevin and wow. a small group of other puppeteers from the south that you know that they had found and they just ran you through the paces and they just ran through 5 could, days who's going to float Yeah and actually Heather Henson was at that was the the first Henson I ever met. <laughs> Heather was at that workshop as as well. She's like, I've never really taken one of these things, so she was learning too. She was there, wow, which was really fun. And um, at the end of that workshop, Kevin Clash said to the groups, like, okay, you know, not everybody can do this. You know, some people know as badly as they want to, they just can't. <laughs> <laughs> so at, at our final little lunch, I got up the nerve to talk to Kevin. Kevin, you know, you know how you said, you know, not not everybody can do this. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, am I one of those people? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Uh, kudos to you for going up to him and just trying and saying, you know, how did I do? Yeah, am I am I good enough? Am and I there? Could, what, I, what could did... I maybe do this? Oh yeah. Oh no 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 no. You no. You're fine. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. I said, well, what should I do? And he said something that I've quoted to hundreds of other uh, up and coming puppeteers um, that want to do this the style of puppetry, and that is, get yourself a camera that you can mm-hmm. plug into a TV. You find yourself a puppet with eyes that can focus, that can appear to look right down the barrel of the lens and a moving mouth and just practice everything we've been teaching you this week. And maybe the next time one of these things comes along, you'll be that much more likely, you know, maybe to get to get hired for something. I don't know. <laughs> OK, from, from there. Yeah. So you did it. You did that. What did you hear from them anytime soon? after? No, no. Workshop? I went home. Well, well, I remember that I was about to go on tour uh, right. with Pinocchio. So I got home. Within the first day, I went to Sears and bought myself uh, a, a camera. Okay. And this, I, actually, I still have this thing. It's this big, hulking RCA camcorder that takes a full-size VHS cassette. Oh, yeah. Cassette. I had one of those. Yeah, baby. Or my dad did, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the right cabling so I could hook it up to different types of TV sets. And uh, I took that thing on tour with me. And mm. every single hotel we'd stop in, I would hook it up to the TV and I would practice the stuff that, that so we hours because you know it's, it's yeah a lot, of, a lot of downtime on a tour like that, a lot of downtime sure. on a tour for sure hours every week and uh i had a couple of okay puppets uh, at the time uh, along the tour i met uh, mary robinette kowal who i mentioned earlier mm-hmm. and she was living in north carolina and building puppets and she said i didn't know and she didn't know there was a puppeteers of america she's I, I didn't know anybody else did this um, and she ended up making me and gifting me a couple of puppets that worked really well, had really great eye focus and lip sync. And so I, I took those along on the tour as well. And sure enough, the following summer, by now we're up to 1991. And because I was a member of Puppeteers of America and on, you know, I'd been working at the Center for Puppetry Arts and I was on all these mailing lists, I got a notice that the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center was going to be holding a puppetry conference and it was going to be led by Sesame Street puppeteers Martin Robinson, mm-hmm. Pam Marciero, and mm-hmm. Muppets performer uh, Kathy Mullen. And it was billed as a, uh, as, as, a, as a workshop for professionals just to further your skills. But it was going to be all about television puppetry. Half the time you would be building, learning how to build a Muppet-style puppet. The other half the time you'd be learning how to perform it on camera. How amazing that that just happened to come your way in this way when you're tr- just trying to get over that hump of learning how to do this monitor technique. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. And I'd been doing happened. them. I'd been working on it, you know, the entire year since that since that yeah. very first workshop. And uh, you had to you had to you had to write a paper, you had to tell them, you know, what your experience was, what you did, what type of puppetry you do. I don't recall if we had to videotape. We probably didn't videotape something, but I had to, you know, do a, a biography and a resume. Um and my father and I didn't have the money for it. I don't remember how even I mean, it was four, five, three, five hundred dollars. I don't know. I, I had no money for it. But uh, I think my father, like, once again, split the cost with me or possibly even paid for it himself. And uh, again, so supportive. And uh, yeah, he believed in you. Yeah, he really did. 
And I, I'm sure you were I'm, showing that that drive, that desire. You know, I think he really knew that I wasn't good at it. anything else. <laughs> <laughs> it's like this this I is gotta, his only shot Brandon, this is all this we got <laughs> I gotta do it. this kid he's not nothing, there's nothing else gonna happen for him oh so you did the you did the Eugene O'Neill and uh, day one conference. day one of that workshop Marty Robinson was telling us what the week was gonna be like and the first thing one of the first things out of his mouth is the Muppets are not hiring this is not an audition not, you're not going to get a job out of this. This is just to further your skills, to broaden your horizons as a, a puppet performer. And, you know, and there are people who did marionettes and rod puppets and mm. shadow puppets. It was all all different, you know, types of puppeteers. Yeah. And there, that was kind of a who's who as well that came out of that that workshop. But anyway, and Jane Henson was there and she was teaching as well. That's kind of a, that's a lot of heavy hitters. That's that a, was a guy. lot. It was a big deal. Well, apparently ab- about a week after, and I had just the most, it was the most miraculous time. And I had my massive RCA uh, VHS recorder and I was recording everything. And then Marty yeah. was there with Telly and uh, uh, Kathy had Moki Fraggle and Pam had Grungetta. And uh, oh, they showed us a Sesame Street outtake reel from season 22. And I was there with my camera filling oh. everything. <laughs> I need to digitize those tapes. I still you have do. Them. I still have them. I hope they work. But about a week after that was over, I got a telephone call from Pat Nugent mm-hmm. uh, saying, we, we'd like you to come up and audition for Sesame Street. Come to New York. I'm, I'm still living in Atlanta at this point. Yeah. And so uh, obviously you said, okay, I'll be I right said, there. Well, I'll think about it. No, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Of course. I'll be there. I'll be there tomorrow. Yeah. And then something happened. So meanwhile, the tour is over. I'm back at the Center for Puppetry Arts. And now they're getting ready for, they need, uh, they're having auditions for resident puppeteers. And for me mm. at the time, resident puppeteer was the end all and be all. You right. are, you are puppeteer. It's right there in your job title. Yeah. You get a real salary, like 350 bucks a week. I mean, yeah. and you are there for the whole, you're a full-time employee basically. And they were doing, the, the fall show was going to be Charlotte's Web and I was going to be Wilbur. And I was like, oh my God, dream come true. And the Muppets, okay, I auditioned for Sesame. Fine, that's before we start rehearsals. No problem. I can do that. Mm-hmm. I can drive my little Toyota Corolla up to New York City. There's some people I know there now from the O'Neill. Allison Mork said I could sleep on her couch. Perfect. And then something happened and they had to move the audition to right smack in the middle of the oh. Charlotte's Web rehearsals. Ugh. Hold it right there, Peter, because it's time for a word from our sponsor. Live hand. Live hand. That's the telephone. Probably an important call about a meeting or something. How will Charles pick up the phone? Yeah, how am I going to pick up the phone? Live hand. Live hand. That's the oven. Beverly's pot roast is ready, and she needs to pull it out of the oven. Apart from oven mitts, what does she use? I don't know. What do I Live use? Live hand. Live hand. Hey, that's the sound of a cookie crunching. An indiscriminate monster with googly eyes is eating that cookie. But how did he grab that cookie and put it in his mouth? Well, me just... Live hand! That's what me was gonna say, but that Echo Guy interrupted. Live hand! Hey, that not cool, Echo Guy. You got to be polite. Oh, Oh, I'm I'm sorry. sorry. I'm I'm sorry. sorry. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, live hands, greatest thing... Since arm rods. Ah, that's right. Today's episode of Below the Frame is brought to you by Live Hands. Uh, you know, uh, there was a special surprise guest in that ad. Wow, I'm impressed at the talent that we have assembled for our ads. Oh, sorry, hang on just a second. Hello? Dad, are you busy? Yeah, Jack, come in, come in. I- I- I'm kind of in the middle of... Recording your podcast, I know. <laughs> Do you need something? I was just wondering if you'd gotten any sponsors yet. No. So you're still doing fake ads? Well, I mean, this is the second one, but yes. Yes, I am. What's the fake ad about this time? Uh, live hands. You mean like Swedish Chef? Oh, yeah. That's right, Jack. It's exactly what I was going to say, in fact. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know how far I need to go into all of this, but, y- you know, you've seen live hands at work on Sesame Street and with the Muppets forever. But if you're still not quite sure you understand what I'm talking about when I say live hands. I'm doing, I'm doing air quotes here. Uh, think of the Swedish chef, you know, in, in particular, his hands. Those are live hands. I mean, those live hands aren't even, you know, fleece-covered puppet hands either. Those are actual hands of an actual human being, Frank Oz in the Muppet Show days. 
And now this this isn't necessarily helpful on live hands talking about, it, but I do remember a, a, a vivid memory of watching The Muppet Show when I was a kid and Sesame Street too. It was seeing the sub sleeve. That's the uh, the part that the performer's arm is in, and it and it leads to the hand, the glove part. It, it's uh, you know, it's usually like on Ernie. It looks like his sweater. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, so when I saw that sub sleeve, a little light bulb went off in my head, and I grew very curious about what the what was happening uh, below the frame there. And, and I think that seeing that sub sleeve really started to stoke the fire for me, uh, and 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 start my love of puppetry. Anyway. Uh, Keep your eyes open. Uh, maybe you'll see a sub sleeve on a live hand character next time you're watching, and and you'll kind of gain a whole new understanding for how these characters work. I'd like to thank Live Hands for being a sponsor of Below the Frame. So, I'm still here. Oh, I'm s- <laughs> sorry, Jack. That's okay. I'm gonna leave now. You're, you're leaving. Yeah, I think my bit here is done. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jack. Mm-hmm. Bye. Below the frame. We are back with Peter Linz, and we're talking about his audition for Sesame Street in New York, an audition that was happening at the same time as his rehearsals for Charlotte's Web in Atlanta. So now you have to make a decision. I have to make a choice. Am I yeah. going to stay and be a resident puppeteer, Center for Puppetry Arts? Or risk it all oh. and drive to New York to audition for Sesame Street. So it was gut-wrenching because it was gut-wrenching because there are no guarantees. Yeah, and if if I didn't do the audition, they they were going to replace me. You you can't, I mean you can't miss three I mean, or four days of a live rehearsal when you're one of the lead characters. You no. can't. Not, not when you're Wilbur the, in Charlotte's Web. No, not when you're Wilbur. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. And I I called um God and I I cried about this decision. It was it was gut wrenching. I finally got the nerve to call. I think I, I was I think I was talking to Pat Nugent and I said, well, Pat, um, I, I told her about my conund- my conundrum and I said, well, how many how many people are auditioning? And she said, "Well, about ten. Okay, all right. Mm. Well, h- how many? How many positions are there?" And she said, nine. <laughs> oh, okay. All right then. Well, that makes it a little easier. Yeah. And Gosh. there's a wonderful uh, human being, Bobby Box, at the Center for Puppetry Arts. Bobby was also a puppeteer. He's not a resident puppeteer, but I think he was assisting. And we worked it out. And Vince Anthony was wonderful. Vince Anthony, the director of the Center for Puppetry Arts, actually the creator of the entire place, is been there since day one he agreed to let us rehearse together and i was i said I, i'll give i'll give up my my one week salary bobby can have that but i'll still rehearse every single day up until i leave and then bobby will keep rehearsing if i get the job you guys are covered if i don't get the job bobby is a wonderful human being said he would step aside and let me have the role back wow and he would go back to doing what he was doing yeah wow that's um pretty nice that's very... Long story short, Bobby went on to become the head puppeteer at the Center for Pup Charts for a number of years, and I got hired by Sesame Street. Yeah, that's that's a great story. I didn't know that. The other people auditioning were already working for Sesame Street. Oh, It was really? already Joey Mazzarino and David Rudman and Kevin Clash and John Kennedy and uh, 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 who else was on those things? I don't recall. But anyway, basically it was a front but... to get me to come up. I ended up being Kevin's arms for these dancing char- dancing monster characters. Right. And uh, I think it was basically a chance for him to try me out and see what I could do. So you're going to move to New York. You get the job. I got the job. Well, move to New York. Well, here's the thing. So back then, the season, they, they were doing something like 130, 131 episodes every year. Yeah, it was year. a lot. A lot. And uh, they were taping six, seven months out of the year. It was a real job. And uh, Danette DeSena, who was a, a, the, our coordinator, would would call and say, "Okay, Peter, darling. Okay, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna need you in New York. We, we, Kevin put you in for a couple of days. Okay, see you later. Bye." And I right. <laughs> never heard anyone talk like that in my life. Right. Like, "Oh, that's so lovely. Okay, well, thank. Okay, see you later. Bye. Oh, oh, oh. oh, th- oh goodbye now." <laughs> <laughs> um, I was I, that first season. I would work two or three days, man, one to three days every two to three weeks. Not all the time. Not all the time. So I would drive. I, I did four round trips back and forth driving Ooh. between Atlanta and New York because I couldn't afford to fly or take the train. And you slept on Allison's? Uh, I slept on Allison Works sofa, sofa. And I would do alternate side parking because I couldn't afford to put my car in a garage. And, and then eventually that seems, because again, because the season's like six months long. Uh, what else? I, I, oh, Pam Marciero had a little pied-a-terre. She had a, a little one-bedroom on the Upper West Side. And uh, boy, I remember that 
and that, I, I ultimately ended up staying there and just staying in New York for the winter. Mm-hmm. And a little little boy from Georgia, staying in a one bedroom uh, apartment that had two radiators, only one of which worked. <laughs> Just uh, broke. Just bro- doing my dream job. Yeah, but you get you're saving every penny. I'm sure saving you, you every penny. To and it, t- it took me like another four or five months to to pay back Pam for the sublease, and she gave me a lovely, lovely deal on it. But it still, uh, you know, I was I was I was uh, living on Slim Fast because I figured it had all the nutrients <laughs> in a can. Yeah, uh, <laughs> or God. the powder. Actually, you get the powder. It was cheaper. Yeah. I was so broke and so cold all the time. Which is like even that apartment, I was freezing. And but you were probably not miserable. Um, no, I was not miserable when I got to go do you my were, dream job. Yeah, you, but even you doing there. my dream job, I would, I I'd get massive headaches every day because I was so stressed. Every day could be my last day. Every day felt for me. I put it on myself. It was an audition. Right. You know, this is every every day was an opportunity to blow it. And oh, yeah. also, but every day was a chance to show them and that's and right. Do it right. Yeah, that's the other side of the coin. And I think yeah. there's a lot of people that we feel that way or felt that way early yeah. on that, that this is, I'm just fighting for my life. I'm here fighting for my life. Day. I cannot blow this. Right. I have to be, I have to be on every moment. So somewhere along in this journey, and I'm not exactly sure when, when did you meet Marlena? Oh, yeah. So I met Marlena. Uh, after my first season of Sesame Street, I was back home in Georgia. And at this point, throughout high school and college, I had worked for this uh, this wonderful guy who had his own men's formal wear store, Boyd Brandt. It was Boyd Brandt Formal Wear. And Boyd was terrific because he pay- he treated me very well. He paid me nicely. And the job was always there. If I had an opening in my schedule or I was you know, home for vacation, he he would always hire me. And that was great. And so after Sesame ended, of course, I didn't have the job at the Center for Puppetry, Puppetry Arts anymore. Uh, so I came home and I worked at Boyd Brandt Formal Wear. And I did a few little other puppet-related things. Uh, <laughs> but it was St. Patrick's Day in 1992. I'd g- come home from working at Boyd Brandt Formal Wear. And uh, <laughs> I love uh, as an that aside, every time you say where you worked, you say Boyd Brandt full- Formal Wear. <laughs> Bob Vance, Vance for first duration. <laughs> I love it. You say the whole name every time. Boyd anyway, was very, sorry. He was very conservative, and he didn't like that I had long hair. So I'd oh. have to. So my sister helped me figure out a way to hide it. So I had to put it in a po- slick it back, put it in a ponytail, and my sister helped me like with hairpins to put it in a little un- bun and tuck it all underneath so it looked like I had short hair. Oh no! <laughs> you know, so you hid it. He was a very conservative guy, and okay. Fine. Yeah. Anyway, so I was home. I was home from Boyd Brandt from where. Uh, there was an Irish pub. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> there was an Irish pub walking to a wonderful place. It's still there in, in Midtown in the Virginia Highlands in Atlanta called called uh, Limerick Junction. And I got a call, a message on my answering machine from my buddy Laura. I said, hey, Peter, I'm down here with a bunch of friends. I'd love to see you. I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, that'd be fun. So I got fixed up and walked over to Limerick Junction. And uh, Laura, by the way, has been a really dear friend since high school, and she had been trying to set me up with this. She had a friend at work. She worked at uh, Dante's Down the Hatch, this wonderful uh, fondue restaurant in underground Atlanta. And she, I knew that she'd been trying to set me up with some, some friend of hers that she worked with for like six months. I, of course, that was not in my head at the time. So I went down there mm-hmm. and a bunch of friends turned out to be this one friend. Wow. And they were, uh, they were drinking green beer sitting next to each other at a, at a counter and, and uh, there was live Irish music. And uh, as soon as I got there and the intru- introductions were made, Laura excused herself. So I was left talking to this girl who had apparently had just finished her student teaching and she was celebrating being done with school because she had done some graduate school and she was done with her student teaching. And so that was it. Hmm. And we talked for a while and Marlena turned out to be her name. Uh, <laughs> nice German girl, first generation American. Her parents were both from Germany. Um, she kept, and she, she always hated this part of the story because she kept, we're up, we're sitting on bar stools and she kept touching my knee every time I would say something that was, she found interesting. So I said, oh, well, I, you know, I just worked on Sesame Street. And she would go, really? That is so interesting. And she would emphasize the words by touching my knee each time. She has no memory it's a little, of that. a little personal. That's a, a little, little, I mean, a you're just flirty, a little personal. A little flirty. <laughs> she always hated that part of the story. <laughs> Anyway, eventually she excused herself to go to the bathroom and and, and uh, Laura came back and I said, Laura, is this by any chance the, the girl you've been trying to set me up with for the past six months? And she got this huge 
eating grin on her face and she said, uh-huh. Like, oh, all right, yeah, she's, she's pretty cute. Yeah. The part of the story Marlena does like to tell, however, is that I was not going to call her. And she called me the next day. What? Well, I had kind of been, I, I dated this other woman-ish and kind of been burned by the experience. So I was, I was kind of off dating at the okay. time. So I was like, you know, she's really nice, but you know, whatever. She called me and asked me out. And, and you said, uh, but you said yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Said, something sure, made you say, yeah. yeah. yeah I, something gone. made me say, well, we had a nice talk, you know? Yeah. She touched my knee. So, you know, <laughs> that's I right. no to that. She doesn't find me repulsive. So we went out on a date. And then, um, boy, that was it. We saw, I mean, the that following weekend, she and her best friend had a trip to Florida that they had planned. But apparently, I found it in retrospect, she talked about me the entire time. She came back from that. We saw each other every single day. And after two weeks, I was like, I knew, I knew that this is it. This is, she's perfect. It was two effortless. weeks. Yeah, I knew. It was just, the timing was spot on. And apparently she knew that too. And we admitted that to each other after dating for two months. Wow. Because we were so ridiculously compatible. Yeah, so we spent that whole spring and summer together and had the greatest time. But yeah, and then that summer, uh, towards the end of the summer, I got a big package of scripts from Danette DeSena. And along with the casting, it's like, oh, I'm going back to the show. And I was thrilled because I didn't know for sure I was going to go back. Meanwhile, Marlena was uh, got a full-time job teaching fourth grade at a school, which is great, which is what she wanted to do. Yeah. So it was perfect. So, like, we're both really happy for each other. And, uh, yeah, so she taught, and I went up to New York. And she came up to New York a couple of times during that, mm-hmm. that season. And I remember that when she – actually, when she came to the set and uh, – and keep in mind, this is only my second season. I don't know everybody really well. She's walking into the Muppet Room at the same, the Muppet Lounge, at the same, you've heard the story, the same time Marty I Robinson. I know what's coming. Is walking out the door. <laughs> and I said, oh, oh, Marty, Marty, I'd like you to meet my fiance, Marlena. And <laughs> Marty says, fiance, I didn't know you were straight. And continues to keep walking out the door. Oh, man. Marlena thought he was the biggest jerk. I said, no, no, that was funny. He's, <laughs> that, was, that, was, he was, that was funny. Oh, that's great. That's a great story. <laughs> She later, you know, came to yeah, know and, and love Marty very, very much. How can you not? <laughs> yeah. So, so you did Sesame Street. Oh, well, well, I did Sesame Street. And then come December, we were going to be rapping pretty soon. And uh, I was talking to my dear friend Carmen Ospar, who plays mm-hmm. Rosita, and said, well, what are you doing after after the season? And she said, oh, I'm working on this new show out in California for six months um, that Kevin's putting together. And I said, I want to work on that. Oh, you should ask him. You should ask him. Okay. And so I said, Kevin, Carmen said, are you you putting together a show in California? And he said, yeah. I said, what could you, could I work on it? And he said, yeah, you want to work on that? Sure. I, I didn't think you'd want to do it. I was like, yeah, I want to do it. <laughs> Why? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I mean, you still have to audition for the producers, but yeah, sure, if you want to, sure. I'll set that up. So he did. And so he did, and I did, and the show was called Puzzle Place. Yeah. You played and Sky and I Nuzzle. I played Sky and Nuzzle. As did you for season three, well, I think. Yeah, that's that's would... getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Uh, Marlena continued to teach, and she came out to California a couple of times. Um, and then uh, after Puzzle Wrapped, I went back to New back to Georgia. And at this point, we're getting up to season twenty five of Sesame Street. Mm-hmm. Marlena and I were married uh, at this point, and um, we decided to, to just Sesame Street was calling again. There was a lot of work happening in New York, and so we decided to move to New York. And uh, and she was fully supportive. She looked at it as an adventure. She was, like, totally gone. Her oh. family, of course, did not want her to leave. Of course not. And they did not want me to take her away from her family. But she was like, it's an adventure. We'll be back to visit. You guys come up and see us. So that's when we moved, finally, we moved. finally moved to New York. So I'm going to p- pause that part of the story just for okay. a minute, because I want to talk a little bit more about just puppetry in general. Mm-hmm. You know, you're such a pristine manipulator of puppets. Thank you. Not of people. That's a different thing, and that is very bad. <laughs> That's a different thing. But you really are one of the preeminent puppeteers in our ranks, I would say. Oh, that's very kind. And, and, and you and I do our the domestic training along with Martin P. Robinson, Marty. <laughs> but you also do international training. For, oh, yeah. you've, you've done like Germany and China and Mexico and I'm sure other places. Uh, uh, and Jordan, Amman, Jordan, mm-hmm. and uh, what, Hong Kong. What are some important aspects when training people in this art form? What are you looking for? You know, I'm not, I, initially I'm not looking for anything. There's so much to learn. Mm-hmm. It's so, it's so dense. 
is the, <laughs> there is so much information to be communicated to someone who's never done this before. And I try when I teach to break it down to its simplest forms. I, I, I will often get a little too technical too quickly, but um, mm. I try not to do that. Uh, I'm, I'm just looking for the slightest... <laughs> This, the slightest little light bulb of them getting it, but but even getting to that point, I mean that can it could take a I long mean, it could take time. weeks. It can take yeah. a long, long time. Sometimes you won't see that. In Oftentimes a you don't have that kind days. of time. Yeah, you don't have that kind yeah. of time to see it. You know what I so look you're for? for? I look for spark. I look for spark. I, I look for improvement. I ju- you know you if 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 from day one to day two you're a little better, and day two from day three you're a little better. That's great. great. You're doing you're doing. That's it. That's all yeah. the, all you can ask for really. Yeah, and you you like teaching. I do enjoy teaching. I find teaching, I find it exhausting. I find it way more exhausting than, than performing. Because <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, when you're teaching you, I mean, yeah. it is a performance of a sort. It is. It is absolutely exhausting. But, do you, you, but you enjoy it? I do. I, I like, and my father was a teacher. He was mm-hmm. a professor. I, I left that off his resume, but he, he taught as well. And, <laughs> you know, you, you, you just live for those aha moments. You see yeah. people start to start to get it. That yeah. was my those were my fingers snapping. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there are probably people listening who want to hear. I hope there's some people listening. You, I do too. <laughs> but those people are probably wanting to hear you tell them what they have to do to become a Sesame Street or Muppet performer. You have to be insanely lucky. Um, mm-hmm. You have to be driven. You have to not be able to imagine yourself doing anything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to get a monitor. That you yes. can hook into a TV <laughs> and a puppet that can, yes. has a moving mouth and eyes that can appear to stare right down the barrel of the lens. Yeah. I don't know if everybody, I'm sure most people that are hearing this do know the thing about the monitor. Right. But can yeah. you just explain a little bit, like, what's the deal with the monitor? Why can't I just look into a mirror and do it that way? Is, yeah, can I do no. That? Why can't you do that? Well, you know, going back to Jim Henson, you know, he he realized early on that in order, you know, when, when Jim was growing up, there were, there were puppets on TV, but they were like glove puppets that didn't have a moving mouth. And there were sometimes, you know, uh, hand puppets with a moving mouth. Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. Kukla, Look Fran, it and Ollie, exactly. Google it. Um, <laughs> Howdy Doody, they were marionettes. Yeah. But Jim realized that in order for puppets to work on television, they have to connect with the viewer. You have to have a character whose eyes can look right into down the barrel of the lens like any actor on television, anybody doing a show, you know, if that's, that's engaging the audience, that's participatory, you want to be able to look. So you have to have a puppet that has eyes. So he figured out there's got to be like a, a, a black or a dark mark against a white background. And mm-hmm. the, uh, the, the, the eyes and the nose they have to be somewhat symmetrical. It needs to make a triangle that can appear to look at a point, one point in space that is right. Also, you have to have a mouth that can open and close. Tele- television is visual, and you have to make it the, the illusion that the voice is actually coming out of that mouth. Mm-hmm. And in order for, to answer your original question, to, to know if where your character is looking, if they are indeed looking right into the camera, or indeed looking or appearing to look into the eyes of whomever they're speaking with, the puppeteer is going to have to look at an, at a, the same image that the viewer is looking at to but be able to why can't why can't it just be a mirror, Peter? Why it can't, can't we be just be a mirror? Because it's not a mirror image; it's a true image. So it's a true image in a mirror. If you look, if you put your hand to the right little mirror, that it it it, it it's opposite of yeah. reality. If you're looking at a monitor, you put your hand to the right; the image on the screen is pointing to the left, and uh, it's a real bit of mind gymnastics to yes get used to that you do it long enough you practice long enough but it's really important that's how we work on the show it's this monitor that is not a mirror image it is the true image it It is is the true image and it has to some people say well why why don't you just and they they do this in some some of the sesame co-productions why can't you just you know modern tell that jim didn't have this this uh, option in the 1950s but why don't you just flip the switch and just make it a a mirror and um you don't do that because you're an artist. You're you're com- you're composing a frame. Everybody in the studio is working to the same picture, and mm-hmm. if you're looking at a flipped version of the image, you're not speaking the same language as the director. You're not speaking right. the same language as your DP, as your cameraman, or even your director. viewer. It's not the same. It's not the same portrait. It's not the same work of art that your viewers watching. Yeah. So, so that's, that's why, it's, why it's important. Monitor is yeah. it's got to be there. Yeah. And 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 puppeteering for TV or film without a monitor? Oh. It's like you might as well be a cameraman without an eyepiece. You know, yeah. oh just point the camera, it'll be right. Yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah. No. Yeah. We've had that happen. People have asked mm-hmm. us why can't you just do it without the monitor? 
No, no. I can't. I can't. I can't. No, no, trust me. It looks good. <laughs> nope. No. Okay, no, fine. No, you don't I look need... at the eyepiece. I won't look at the monitor. We'll see <laughs> yeah. how it looks. Um, uh, going back to a question you said uh, about what do you need to work on Sesame Street and mm-hmm. with the Muppets, and I was giving you very technical answers. Yeah. Even more important than any of those things is you have to be a good actor and you have to be a good improver. You have to do acting and improv. That is that is my one regret in in my in my childhood and growing up. Something that I didn't do is I didn't take acting classes. I didn't take improv. I suppose I have a knack for it. Apparently, because yeah, I, I make my uh, living doing part- it. <laughs> but um, I would. I, but I work with people who have had formal training. Matt mm-hmm. Vogel, Hi. who I see just killing it with with every character they touch and. Uh, and, and working in film, working with uh, getting to work with Amy Adams and, and Jason Siegel, people who are just masters at their craft, right? And who would never do a scene the same way twice, and yet every single take would be spectacular. You'd be happy to have any yes. of those takes. It comes from a really strong foundation of acting and improv. And this is my my <laughs> my current soapbox, my current complaint mm-hmm. with our with the not all but many up and coming puppet performers that I see these days is that their manipulation is on point. There's, they're doing so great. But the one thing we're really, really missing is the acting, acting right. and improv chops. It, yes. It's so important. I think it's been missed in favor of uh, this, this, uh, this surgical, surgically precise mm-hmm. manipulation, which is great. It's, it's a all great, thing. great, but it's, but they're all parts of the, the toolbox. You have they're to have all, all the tools. You have to have the all the tools. You can't just be a spectacular manipulator. Yeah. You've got to be able to act. You've got to be able to make bold acting choices, mm-hmm. interesting, different bold acting choices, and you need to be able to riff. You've got to be able to improv uh, uh, in character. Right. Um, and that's something that I, frankly, struggle, I don't want to struggle with, with, but I'm very conscious of working on. Me too. Well, um, you, I think we have to be. That's just kind of yeah. part of our nature. We want to improve. We're always wanting to improve. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, if I if I had to do, do over again, I'd go to college for for theater hmm. and uh, do nothing but. Unfortunately, when I was in school, uh, and I looked, I wanted to take acting and improv classes, but at the time, if you were a major, you were that's your major. You're in that right. channel. That's it. They had one. There was one class my freshman year. It was called acting for non drama majors, oh. and I was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad. But that was the only chance I had. And then yeah. you weren't eligible to go out for plays or take acting or improv because mm. that was just for theater majors, which I was, unfortunately, I was not. Well, you've taught so many people. You've taught classes for Sesame Street, but you also do, uh, you, you do something called Beyond the Sock. Yeah, yeah. Right? How long have you been doing that? Years, like seven years now, I think. And I, is it you and Noel McNeil? It's myself and Noel McNeil and, mm. and a puppet builder named Pasha Romanovsky. And basically... We're in a way recreating that very first O'Neill Center conference in a little mm. bit less time, uh, with a little less star power. <laughs> I don't but know. Uh, it's a similar kind of thing where half the time the students are learning are building a puppet led by Pasha, uh, and the other half of the time they're with me and Noel uh, in a in a studio at a film school working you know on camera with cameras and monitors. How many participants do you usually take? I think the most we can take is 24. I want to say, I think maybe in the past we've had many, as many as 26. But we try to keep it not too. We have, we have two groups of 12 people each. Mm-hmm. And, and that's great because just, just for this student-teacher ratio, we want everybody to get as much on-camera time as possible. And it's great with it because we're at this the, the University of North Texas Film School. They actually have a working studio. We can have three cameras going, simul- three camera stations going simultaneously. Each camera has two or three monitors attached to it. Um, oh. Noel and I can circulate. Um, you know, when we start out, we start to you know in 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 the whole group of twelve, but mm-hmm. eventually you split up in smaller groups. And and if if you're interested in this beyond the sock, where do you go to to learn about it? I mean, I think I there might actually have... be a beyond a beyond the sock dot com. I know there's a Facebook page for Beyond the Sock. It generally Hopefully takes place in early June mm-hmm. in Denton, Texas, which is about an hour north of Dallas. Okay, we're gonna go back to Sesame Street now. Hey, let's do that. But. Before we do, imagine that I've never been to Sesame Street before and I am not a puppeteer. What would you tell me about what I'm going to see? Yeah, a big scene of puppets. Well, you'll see the famous set, of course. You'll see the, the steps, the one, two, three steps and Hooper Store and the Arbor mm-hmm. and uh, you know, all those iconic landmarks. Uh, it's a big scene with puppets. You're going to see <laughs> you're going to see a bunch of people basically on the floor scooting around on these little butt dollies. It's basically a, a cushion that's maybe... I don't know what four or five inches thick with yeah. the with the inline skate wheels underneath it, 
that are nice and silent mm -hmm. and little cushions. Uh, those people are going to be working with their arms up in the air over their heads, and you'll see the various characters on their hands. Oftentimes, you'll see two people underneath one puppet. Uh, if it's Cookie Monster, say, so you'll have someone, David Rudman will be performing his head and left hand, and someone else will be doing his, another puppeteer will be doing the right hand, but they're all squished together. And you'll see all these people very, very close, working very, very close together, occupying a very small space, because the puppets are not so large, and yeah. if you don't want to have them spread far apart in the frame. You want them close together, you know, Abby and Elmo talking to each other. You can have the puppeteers underneath them, which are much bigger people than the puppets, <laughs> also squished together. Yep. If there is a human in the scene, like uh, like Alan, they'll they'll be standing up there generally behind the, the puppeteers with the puppets mm -hmm. coming up about, you know, their mid-chest. What are we, and, see, and the puppeteers, what are they doing? They're looking at monitors. There's yeah. usually a whole bank of these little, I don't know, what are they, 10-inch monitors? Nine-inch, something like Nine-inch monitors, uh, all spread out on the floor in strategic locations. If a character has to walk from point A to point B, there will be monitor, monitor, monitor spread out along their path so they can see every step of the way. You know, yeah. uh, they can see a monitor the, the entire time. We always want to see what always. it is. Always. always. Cables everywhere. There's yeah. be three big cameras. Sometimes, often, there's a, a, a jib camera as well. Yeah. And uh, boy, a bunch of people. That's, That's right. So All working people. to try to make this show happen. Make the show happen. Yeah. No, no, no studio audience. You know, no. we'll get, we often get visitors, but uh, but there's no audience. There's no, no audience. No, no space for that, no. really. Okay, so Peter, you've done so many roles on Sesame Street over the years, and I've actually got a crack research team. And they have done a little bit of poking around to find some AM characters that you played over the years. Okay. Oh my word. And I want to see if you know who I am talking about. Okay. Okay. These are characters that you have played. Okay. Do you know who Elmore is? Elmore? Mm hmm. Do you know Elmore? <laughs> he sounds like Elmo's cousin. Mm, uh, no. 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 Is El he? Okay. Elmore. El Elmore is a pet woodchuck of. Mrs. Malloy, played by Camille Benora. Okay. And she brings him to Sesame Street. Uh-huh. She brings him to the bus stop to go downtown. Okay. A favorite thing of his. And Elmore quickly becomes fascinated with Benny Bunny's teeth, even <laughs> more so when he sees how he can squeak them. That is in episode 3376, Peter. Any recollection of that at all? <laughs> I, I got nothing. Nothing. I got, I mean, I know those characters. I know those right? performers. Yes. Elmer the Woodchuck? Was Elmore he a silent woodchuck, character? Yeah. I, 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 don't, I, do. I don't know. I, don't I enjoy that, the silent characters. It. Okay, now I'm going to give you a description of this AM, and you can tell me who it is, all right? Oh, my god! This is more recent. More recent, This Peter. is harder than I thought. It okay. is hard, yeah. So this can Well, you played hundreds of characters. So I, I, I yeah, can't, fair enough. I can't okay. even remember bits I did last season. Fair enough. Okay, this character helped Murray measure the length of a surfboard. Now, what kind of animal was this AM? Bonus <laughs> points if you can remember the AM's name or the title. Do you remember we, we used to do are those you things sure? Are you sure, this is, are you this sure is both you, of these are I me? I am told that this, this is you. This sounds, I don't know about this. this I'm told this people. is you. This was Surfer Lamb. Surfer Lamb? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a lamb. And you probably had a surfer voice. I probably tried to yeah. totally talk like this. He totally yeah. talked about, you know, shredding some sweet water. I'm out there sure. Head and glass yes. and a drop to sky. All right. You're yeah. definitely going to get this one. Oh, God. This was featured in a crummy I, picture I'm segment. I'm over two. That's okay. You're going to get this one for okay. sure. Okay. This is featured. This character was featured in a crummy picture segment. Uh-huh. Tries to help Cookie Monster not eat his not partner. Not eat the boat. Not oh. eat his partner. Oh, 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 a yeah. A chewy cookie. Yeah, 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 yeah. That What's was uh, yeah. That was Luke. Luke uh, was it Luke Pie Walker? Yes, in Star S'mores. That's Star right. S'mores. And you it, you were so perfect in that because you were so whiny, <laughs> just like Luke Skywalker is I, in a, in Star Wars. I made a choice really oh, early so on great. just to just to whine every line I could. It was great. Oh, it was it was so <laughs> enjoyable. All right, you went away okay. from Sesame Street. For I a did. While. You and know, I did go away from Sesame for a while. Yeah. What year did I do that? Well, I think in 1996. It might I have want been to say 95. something. Yes, for, for the number of years that, even though I went, I did go away from Sesame Street around 95 or 96. Um, I was always in at least one episode every season, even the okay. seasons I wasn't a regular for or around on the set. There was right. always something that that I, I would be brought in for, okay. at least one, at least one. But okay, carry on. While you were away. You went on to be on a primetime TV show called Aliens in the Family. <laughs> what can you tell me about that show? Pretend I've never seen it, which 
I did see it in the day. I okay. did watch it. Well, ABC apparently had a chance with two different alien shows. One was called um, Aliens and the Family, and they decided that was going to be the winner. The other show was this lousy, crazy idea called Third Rock from the Sun. They passed on that. Um, <laughs> so they went with Aliens and the Family. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was the Brady Bunch, except instead of, of a man with three boys and a woman with three girls, it was a man with three boys and an alien woman with three alien children. So weird. It's, it's perfect. What did you do on that show? I, well, I was mostly right-handing for David Rudman with, with uh, his little baby character, Bobut. And uh, I was also, I started doing a lot more incidental characters. I was, uh, there was some candies called, what are they called, Yuckles or Chuckles? And somehow mm-hmm. some experiment went wrong and they came to life. And they're basically giant gumdrops. So I did one of the Yuckles. The alien side of the family was all worked up because the Lord High Elder was coming. And they were all terrified of the Lord, a high elder. I played the Lord High Elder. It was this tiny little puppet, <laughs> like, like just a shriveled little green man. What was that like to be on a primetime TV show <laughs> there? That was a lot of fun. The scripts were pretty funny. I was working I was working with my friends, you know. I was working mm-hmm. with uh, Alice Deneen and Joey Mazzarino and David Rudman. Uh, John Kennedy was, was doing Bobit's Eyes. And that was a pretty cool show. They And because it was a primetime sitcom, they had a, it was a really big budget. And so they built, the set that they built was amazing. It was... Uh, the entire set was elevated like four feet off the floor and it was built on these four, I think about four foot by four foot platforms that you could pull out. And so it, like when I was, um, I was playing this, the elder sitting on the coffee table, I could actually be fairly comfortable. They, they'd pull out the, one of those four by four plugs. I could sit on the real floor or up on an Apple box on the real floor with my arms straight up through the coffee table. Uh, so, and I, that way my, my larynx wasn't crushed. I could still yeah. do the character voices and act. And any of us doing these incidental characters could do that because they had raised the entire set, which was, which was pretty cool. I'd never worked on a set like that. Yeah, it's pretty fancy. Uh, yeah, yeah. Around this time, you and Marlena had your own family. We right? did. Somewhere we in our, here. Our little baby twin girls were born. Yeah, Aria and Micah. And then, and then Jonah came. Jan- Jonah came along about five and a half years later. We weren't... Uh, we had twins, and they were wonderful, and it was, oh, they're just the, the greatest girls. And uh, we weren't sure if we wanted a third. Are we going to have a third? I don't know. Are we, I, don't, I don't know if we want, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Oh, oh we're having one. Okay, well, we're having a third. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, you're kind of you're living a great life. You're doing that job that you wanted to do ever since you were yeah. eight years old. You're doing yeah. it. And then in yeah. 1997, I think, or 96, I'm not sure, you got a call for an audition. For yeah, a new children's show. yeah, for a, a, another puppet show. The, the mm-hmm. auditions were being held at the at the Henson Carriage House, which was the original offices of, of Henson Associates. Yeah, and it was for a, a show that it was for a pilot produced by the Jim Henson Company called Bear in the Big Blue House. And I auditioned for actually I auditioned with Joey Mazzarino with the Otters. Oh, There's you did? Otters. Yeah, and I, their original names were Pummel and Pop. <laughs> Pummel. Pummel. I know. <laughs> <laughs> But instead, it's Pip, and you played Pip. I played Pip. And there was a little mouse who was originally female, a little mouse named Mouse. And it was a cute script. And uh, I, got, I, got the, I got the part from the audition, and we shot, actually shot the pilot in the carriage house. And uh, yeah, I ended up doing a show, a whole, gosh, four seasons? Yeah. yeah. And, a show called Bear in the Big Blue House. And you play, got to play Tutter. You played the, play Tutter, the little maid of... A boy mouse, I eh? made a boy na- so, mouse named Tutter, so, who had much less of a, a much less of a New York accent than he did in the pilot, but still a little bit. Tell me about Tutter, but tell me about the puppet. How did that puppet influence As your performance? One of my one of my favorite favorite puppets I've ever performed. I because he's so simple, so tiny and so and tiny. So he's a sock, He's basically a sock puppet. He really is. He just fit super snugly on my hand. You know, any any type of little movement I could do with my fingers would translate as expression, not unlike mm-hmm. Kermit. He had internal arm rods. I never had a pup with internal arm rods. The arm rods just, and these are just basically wires that just went up uh, the, the sleeve of the puppet to the shoulders and made a sharp angle turn down into the arms. And there were two of those. And initially I couldn't do much with them, but I, I figured out by the way I held the the bottom of the arm rods in my hand, I could I could make Tutter shrug. I could push up on them and make him shrug. <sighs> I could make him open and close his hands. And there was a third ro- internal rod that went up to his tail. Oh. And uh, so I could hold, I found I could hold the two arm rods 
uh, between my thumb and index finger and that little meaty part. And mm -hmm. then with, with my thumb and the tip end of my middle finger, I could I could roll the, the wooden dowel that was attached to the bottom part of the rod and make and a tail, tail waggle. Oh, that's so cool. So he's just so he's expressive. No no mechanisms, no eye blink, no nothing. Fa he was a glorified sock puppet. But also you're so funny. He is such a oh, funny little character. I had so much fun with that guy. He uh, He's just so apoplectic. <laughs> it's just he's, he's neurotic and apoplectic. Can't, and it was yeah. so fun being able to. And, and at the same time, he could be really sweet and really quiet. Yeah. A nice, fully rounded character. So, yeah. Really, right? And you know how he's going to react in any situation. Yeah. and. Usually with fear. Um, <laughs> ah, yeah, I just love doing that character. And what a lovely bit of puppetry as well. Uh, Peter, hold everything because it's time to ask a puppeteer about not puppets. Ask a puppeteer about not puppets. Today, we ask a puppeteer about not puppets. And that puppeteer is Fran Brill. If you could live anywhere in the world for a year, Fran Brill, where would it be? Oh. Provence. Oh, why? Well, my parents were French, so that's, you know, and I've been back to France many times, and it is the most beautiful part of the world. Uh, my husband and I rented a house for a week once, and all I wanted was to be a paysan and speak French. A what? A what? A what? Paysan. What uh, a a native, is. a native. Ah, okay. okay. And, uh, of course. You know, and just just live the life and i i would i would love to try that or have an apartment in paris for uh, an unlimited time there are so many incredible nice. parts of the world though it would be great to just do 6 months you know in dubai and 6 months in paris yeah. and you know there's it's, okay. it's a great world out there but i would it would probably be france yeah somewhere in france okay a good answer. Ask the puppeteer about not puppets. We are back with Peter Linz, and we are talking about characters. And speaking of characters, now on Sesame Street, you play Harry Monster. Yeah. So Harry and Jerry, Jerry Nelson. Yeah. Is there anything that you channel for Harry that is Jerry? I mean, you were around when Jerry was around, and he played Harry. Something. Yeah, no, not, definitely. Not, not, I, I right-handed for him a bunch with, with yeah. Harry and Count and all, a lot of And did characters. you take any of anything from Jerry and put it into your interpretation of Harry? Eric Jacobson likes to remind me that, that Harry's voice was roughly based, or at least the speech pattern was roughly based on Jimmy Durante. Right. Auditioning for Harry and, and performing him, I, I, I do this with Ernie as well. I always go back to the source material. I, mm -hmm. I look at, you know, the, the classic stuff I grew up with and to, to inform who, me who the character is. Personally with Jerry, <laughs> you know, Jerry could do so many characters and he was such, gosh, such a, a mega athlete with his voice. Yeah. Not, not just his voice, but also his mind as the mental gymnastics to be so many different characters. I don't know if I can speak to anything directly from Jerry himself. Yeah, other than the character that he yeah. gave the world. And you did that same thing with Ernie. Oh, yeah. Oh, you yeah. Know? You're Even so more great so. at his playfulness, and you're so always so clued in to Ernie on the acting side of it. You know, you feel like that's all drawing from the source material. It is. Well, it's two things. It's twofold. One is, of course, growing up with him. Mm -hmm. um, but secondly, it's really interesting studying Ernie. You know, I say I go back and I'll watch, uh, and there's these wonderful compilations on YouTube of classic Ernie and Bert. There's so much. And, and Ernie evolved over time, like our characters do, but even the voice, you know, changed mm -hmm. a little bit. And uh, But what's fascinating is going back and not just watching it to be entertained by it, but but studying it and actually saying, okay, how is Ernie reacting to Bert? How is he not reacting to Bert? Mm -hmm. um, from, from a technical standpoint, what does Jim do with the hands? What does Jim do with the mouth, with the lip sync? And there's a lot of things that Jim did with that character that I naturally don't do. That that when I do when I do my puppeteering style technique with Ernie, it doesn't look like Ernie to me. It looks mm. wrong. For instance, if I if I if I move the mouth to every single syllable I'm saying, you know, when you're doing lip sync, when you're teaching, I always say, well, you want to when you start out, you want to say lip sync every single syllable. Right. But if you watch Ernie, and actually Jerry Nelson did this all the time, he skip syllables. Yeah. You know, peanut butter and jelly, peanut butter and jelly, seven syllables. Seven mouth flaps. Seven mouth flaps. But, but Ernie, 
peanut butter and jelly. It might be four or five. You may have done, yeah, four or five. There. That's because when, and, I, and Jim and Frank discovered this too, is sometimes watching their stuff back, particularly on film, if they were doing every syllable, the puppet would blur. It would strobe. It would look blurry. It doesn't yeah. look right. The other thing that I do that Jim didn't is I do these micro reactions. And I think this is something I learned from Kevin Clash. A mm-hmm. lot of us, you yeah. know, he was our... Well, I've, I've told Kevin to his face. He's my mentor and tormentor. Um, <laughs> Kevin's puppetry was so beautiful and so mm-hmm. surgically precise. And that was a huge influence on me. And so my own puppetry tends to, I try to embody that. Jim did not. You know, when, when, I'm, when I'm playing some other character, I'll do all these little micro reactions. So you can kind of, I, you know, I want to I communicate what's going on inside his head mm-hmm. to the audience while he's reacting to whatever situation he's in. Yeah. Ernie doesn't do that. Ernie just looks. He just watches. <laughs> and he holds very still. And, and uh-huh. even when Bert screams or loses it, I'm watching he's, Ernie and he's just he's just watching. He's just like, hmm, okay. You know, and it's, <laughs> it's a totally, it's awesome. It's and so really, are you, really fun. you're trying to I'm, replicate that in some absolutely. way? Absolutely. Kind of I, am, I am trying to be as true to Jim Henson's Ernie as I possibly can be. You know, I, I have a very different instrument in my voice. Yeah. I, my, you know, I'm a completely different human being. Right. Um, and it's, boy, it is, it is such a challenge. And you know this, it is yeah. such a challenge taking on a legacy character. Up until Ernie and Harry Monster, I don't, I didn't do any legacy characters. No. Even with, with Muppets, uh, it was my own character. With, uh, with Sesame Street, I was doing those incidental characters, which you reminded right. me of that I still Elmore. can't remember. You remember Elmore and <laughs> Surfer Lamb. And Elmore and Surfer Lamb, sure. Hundreds sure. of others. I also remember Orton. Oh, I remember see, the, the backup probably... singers for, for yeah. Polly Darton. Yeah. Or, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, Polly Darton. Um, but, but you're right. You know, we both had the opportunity to create roles, uh, yeah, originate a character, and we've had the honor and responsibility of taking on roles. To that... become custodians yes. of, these, of these legacy characters. And what are the differences in creating a role from nothing yeah. and taking over for somebody like you did so much harder. Arnie and Harry? And... So much harder. So, yeah. so creating your own character is so liberating. Yeah, yeah. you know, there's there's no wrong choices. <laughs> yeah, and we'll talk about you know, this in a minute because I do want to get to Muppets. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and you're safe. No matter how, however you say a line, that's the right way to say it. That's how the character would say it. <laughs> yeah. When you're when you're taking on a legacy character, you were you were trying. You're not just trying to replicate someone's you know voice. That's the thing. That's a huge thing that's out there. Like, oh, oh, I, I do a great Elmo voice. I do a great Kermit voice. I was like, mm-hmm. well, that's awesome. The voice is such a tiny part of it. For sure, it's part of it. Yeah. But it's such a tiny part of it. Such yeah. a small part of it. And it's so much more important to get the the character, to know who that character is, to know what drives them, to know how they'll react in any given situation. Uh, and, and also, and you've said this before, you know, it's not, it's not a museum piece. You're not trying to replicate someone else's performance. I mean, in a way you are, but but at the same time, it's not under, under plexiglass. This character, right. like, I don't, I don't know... I don't know how Ernie would say the word internet. Right. Because I never heard Jim never... say internet. <laughs> <laughs> but they have to be able to live uh, on beyond. They have to live on and they have to continue to grow and they, yeah. they have to you know be in the modern world. They can't just be beholden to things they've said before. That's right. Yeah. And they, they are going things. to grow with, with you as you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you do have evolve. to make them a legacy character. You do ultimately have to make your own and be comfortable uh, in their skin, but that can take a really long time. And and right. thank you for your kind words about Ernie. I f- still feel like I have a lot of work to do, and I do. I still will study Jim. I will still look at those YouTube clips because I'll I'll start getting to my own habits. I'll start micro reacting to Bert, yeah. and I'll I'll start flapping the mouth more. Like, <laughs> okay, no, no, bring it down. Simplify. Yeah, simplify, simplify. And you're simplify. doing that while you're also acting uh, oh yeah sure yeah that's right while you're also partner you know you're also kind of processing all of these things there's so many things coming into your brain at one time you're also trying to see if you're framing okay you're watching the lines you're you know you're you're working with your scene partner eric jacobson it's a lot lot. of multitasking it's a lot lot to do so it doing a legacy character and the the responsibility and the expectation Mm -hmm. you know these these characters have fans they're not fans because of me right (laughs) i know they're not you know (laughs) the they're not watching these these wonderful bits. They're like, oh my gosh, right. Ernie, yeah. because of me. It's because it's Ernie. It's Jim yeah. Henson. Jim. It's, it's Jim. It's, yeah. you know, and, and later years of Steve. And for a little while there, Billy. So, you know, all, anyway. we, you and I, we have something, in, we both have something in common here. I mean, a lot of things, but one of those things is that we do 
we both have Eric Jacobson as an acting partner, me with Kermit, yeah, and Eric's yeah. and Miss Piggy, and you as Ernie with his Bert. Yeah. So let's just talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about Eric. Let's, yeah, let's dish on Eric. Eric. He's not here. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's so... He Eric doesn't listen is, to stuff. No, he, he's such a consummate performer. He is so detail-oriented. Oh and he's focused not only on the character, but so many times on the comedic timing and the delivery that is specific to that character in any given yeah. scene. Like talk about talk about surgical. Oh yeah, he's and intentional and, and psychotic. No, uh. yeah. I, I, I love. I do love working with him. He's the yeah. he's a great scene partner. Oh my gosh, yeah, he, absolutely. And you know, you know, you're going to look good working with Eric because he will not settle for anything. Yeah, but. He will work the bit until it is the right way. Until it is until exactly it is right. right. Yeah, yeah he's, that's right. He's he will. And it also helps that you and I are both very, very good friends with Eric. You know? Yeah. Um, I've said, you know, I don't know how this works with you guys with Kermit and Piggy. I, I feel like for me and Eric, the Ernie and Bert dynamic, it just, the dynamic part, you know, never, never mind. Getting the character right, that that does not come easy, easily. Mm-hmm. But the dynamic, it was there from, from the word go yeah. with me and Eric. Yeah. Because I feel like even personally, we... We do embody you do. <laughs> some yeah. elements of those characters. You're very much Ernie like as a person, and he's as a person, very much yeah, like as a person. He, so... he, has a, he has a goofy side to him as well, but he, he does. He also is a he's a very much, and like, I have a serious side to me as well, absolutely and, and dull side. But <laughs> but in speaking in terms of generalities, Eric is very precise and very yes. deliberate. Whereas I'm like, ah, eh, it's good enough. Yeah, yeah, which is a perfect pairing. It's so great. Yeah. I mean, that's it. You're right. <laughs> the dynamic is perfect there. So we're going to talk about the Disney Muppets now, shall we? Oh, let's do. All right. So you worked on Muppets from Space. I did. We, we were doing season three of Bear in the Big Blue House, and I got a call from Martin Baker. And he said, Peter, how are you? We're, mm. do, we're doing a film down in Wilmington, North Carolina. We'd love you to come be a part of it. And so you cool. went down there, and you mostly did Miss Piggy in the film. I, that's what I ended up doing. Originally, I was just, you know, one of the the kind of the second tier guys, just uh, doubling for people and doing right hands. And um, yes, yeah, Steve was actually supposed to do Piggy, and he mm. really didn't want to. <laughs> and, and I so think somehow I'd, you got somehow I think I did Piggy for a scene, and I think Steve even just looked up was like Peter, why don't you why don't you do Piggy? He's like, oh, okay. And I remember Bill Barretto was the puppet captain on that. He's like, you, are you, you, you sure you, you sure you got this? Like, yeah, definitely. He's like, yeah, okay. Uh, now you know that you're in the trailer. Your voice is in there a few times still. I know, I know. It's crazy. That's it's crazy. Yeah, there was that was uh, that wasn't supposed to be. But. but in the trailer, I just listened to the trailer again last night because I remembered when I saw the trailer back whenever that was, 1999. Yeah. I remember thinking that wasn't Frank. <laughs> it was something like her falling down the steps or, or tripping or something. Yeah. And it was, oh, and it was definitely yeah, I think that was her not... big entrance in the film when she walks yeah. into Bunsen and Beaker's lab for the first time. Man, I remember that. Falls. I remember that because she's walking in and, you know, Brian Henson was directing and something he wasn't quite happy with the way I was making her swing her hips as she was walking in. And so Bill's like, here, here. And, and Bill rarely does this, but he took the puppet and he tried right. to do it. He's like, oh, no, no, you're making this look so much better than me. And he gave me, gave me piggyback. And when I fell... Bill says in his way, very quietly, Bill is such an amazing, amazing mentor and supporter. Yeah. And he says, so what's, what's going on? What's going on when she, when she trips? What's going on in your head? I said, oh, she, she, broke, she broke a heel. He's like, okay, okay, good. Yeah. He just wanted to make sure I, I was, had a specific yeah. choice. Not just falling. I wasn't just falling for the sake of falling. I said, yeah. oh, okay, good. It ended up being, I was doing piggy. Bill, I think, grabbed the outside of her hips just below camera frame and did this little back and forth motion mm-hmm. and brian stuck his hands up he was going in front of me trying to give her legs oh gosh <laughs> i mean it's beautiful it is yeah it's, it's a love it's something they used it in the trailer yeah song. yeah any other muppet stuff after muppets from say uh, after that before the big one came along in 2011 2010 before 2011 yeah between muppets from space and 2011 I'm not sure if I got my years right. The first Muppet thing I ever did was a Muppet meeting film. Mm-hmm. I was assisting uh, Steve. I think it was just Dave and Steve, and I was an assist on that for a few days in New York. Mm. There was a home video version, a home video, sing-along video yeah. from Muppets Treasure those. Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I worked on that, um, assisting, and I, I think I actually got to do, I did get to do one of the boars. So I even have a picture. So that was um, before Muppets That was Space. before, was it? I think so. Okay. Well, yeah, I don't know. That was before. Maybe. Yeah, so I had done some stuff with the Muppets. Letters to Santa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Letters that to Santa. That was before. Yep. There was a couple of Muppet commercials that I was involved with that were shot in New York City 
We shot on a boat, and we shot at night wow. in the theater district. Then along came Walter. Yeah. And you are so perfect as Walter because he is, he's you. He's me. He I is know. you. I mean, yeah. and I think every puppeteer auditioned for that role. Yeah. Yeah, they but, they did. They had huge, they even had some non-puppeteers who do improv out on the West Coast audition oh, for him. But you got it. Do you remember the audition? Yeah, I sure do. The first audition was Debbie McClellan in a room uh, in, in New York City. Um and I don't, I think there were some sides. Yeah, there were some, mm-hmm. there were a couple of sides, some, some, you know, a few pages of script. And I think we had to sing a song. And, you know, like so many of us do after an audition, I was like, oh, that they'll never call. I'll never hear right. that. I blew it. I was okay, but eh, it wasn't that great. I won't get this. And I think it was two weeks later, I got a call and I was one of five people. You were <laughs> one of the five people too, were you not? Uh, I might have been. Because I, I, I was, was out in me, LA that I did the audition. You, we did that. Joey, Kevin. Yeah. yeah. Me, you, Joey, Kevin. All mm. I know is the day that I found out I got it, every single one of you reached out to me in one form or another to congratulate me, yeah. which I thought was just such a testament to the camaraderie and the and the and the family and how much of an ensemble we really are. Yeah, the fact that you know that, that wouldn't happen with any other audition. No, but all no. these guys who are friends who have worked with for years, each one reached out to me. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, you're perfect. Uh, it's it's well, you're, you're, you're the kind. guy. So uh, you got to create that character. You got to you got to work with James and work with James and Jason. Yeah, to yeah. help create and that Bill. character. Yeah, and, I mean, like any like like any actor going into uh, going in for a role in a film, the script's written. Right. You know, there's the writer in this case, Jason and uh, and uh, Nick Stoller. Nick Stoller. Yeah. Yeah. Nick Stoller had written the character, but you know, our job as a character actor is to go in and flesh it out, make it three dimensional. Mm-hmm. Speaking of making it three dimensional, then you've got the workshop of designing the character. Right. Um, yeah. So the only hint that was given to me before the final audition was I was told that they said that if if the character were going to be cast in a human as a human, they right. said Michael Sarah would already have the part if we're going to a human. That's right. So that was it. So I just started watching every Michael Sarah thing, not That's unlike right. what I do with Ernie and Harry Monster, watching every yeah. Michael Sarah thing I could get. Yeah. And I remember you know, the lead up to that. So Kevin and I were on the flight together. He was sitting behind me. We were on the flight to L.A., and I think he was. I think he went before me, mm-hmm. uh, and it was at the um, the Amarano Hotel in Burbank, mm-hmm. in a little conference room on the first floor. <laughs> and uh, I got there the day before, and I was just. I kind of was just locked in my room, and I was just watching. I was watching Super Bad. I was watching <laughs> um, Youth Youth in Revolt a whole bunch, uh-huh. and I had saved the sides from the original audition, so I would imagine how Michael Sarah and one of his characters would interpret those lines Mm -hmm. and try to try to try to mimic his voice. And, and then also I thought about, well, Walter is a huge Muppet fan. I tried to kind of load up some ideas uh, for any, because I I knew improv was going to be part of it. Like, well, I I decided, okay, well he, I bet Walter writes for Muppet fan sites. I bet he does fan fiction. And yeah. so I had oh, some things in my pocket ready good. to go. I remember that. I remember that he he, he had a life, a whole other life that was that, yeah. he, that was not in the script so, that was your Right. And so I went stuff. into the audition having that in my head, having those yeah. made those choices. And I remember it was it was around the fourth of July just after Fourth of July. And you know, I'd been kind of talking like this for you know, working on my on my own, just kind of being a very deadpan and <laughs> Yeah. Before the audition, I went to breakfast. There's a wonderful place called BB's right across the street from the Amarano. And I went there for breakfast. And because it was 4th of July holiday weekend, the place was empty. It was just me and this young, cute waitress behind the counter. Mm. Not unlike <laughs> someone from a Michael Sarah film. <laughs> and it was, and I'd, I'd been talking like this in, by myself in my room for so long. I was talking to her like this. <laughs> I just, I was just... And she bought it. She didn't, she wasn't like, uh, are you doing a voice? No, no, no. no. (laughs) But it was really weird after just being kind of quarantined for the first time and just being so in that head, just getting in that mindset because I knew the pressure. I knew what this could mean for me. I knew that this was an enormous once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I Mm -hmm. knew that, and I was determined to, if not to get it, to at least know, go in knowing that I did the absolute best. Not not do a B job, not do a B plus job. Doing right. that, which is what I did all through high school. <laughs> Get in there and <laughs> and just do the absolute best I could do. So, yeah. so yeah. when you got it, and then we're shooting oh. it, did you approach shooting that movie any differently than than you'd done up to now with anything else? Definitely. So definitely. 
What, you know, what kind of on, process? What was it for you? What was different about it than a, no, a number of things? First of all, I, I memorized. I would memorize scenes. We, you know, we'd get our scene. We, we'd know what scenes were going to be shot for that day, and so for a day or two before, I would be memorizing the scene. Yeah, I because because what be we do on Sesame page. Street is we just we tape our lines up to the monitor. That's just yes. the way we do it. The scripts are changing very quickly. Oftentimes, there's, the there's day, the day so of. much material coming in. It moves very very quickly, and uh, you know, some people do and can memorize Carmen Osbar, <laughs> Marty Robinson, <laughs> right, right, but. Most of us tape our lines up. No, but yeah. for film, everything is so intentional. Every single, it's so crafted mm-hmm. um, that I would not only memorize the scenes, I would think about, and this I don't do with typically, uh, I would think about where my character was looking. I would think about where his eyes were looking for each word, for each phrase. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would, at a much more deliberate approach. Um, at the same time, I would be open to improv. And, and, but yeah. I, I found that going in there, knowing where I would look when and where I was coming from and typically what would be the most honest read of a line, that was – I felt so secure with that that I could riff on that. I could, I yeah. could go off of that. Uh, you seemed so loose on that movie. I mean uh. I know that – you really did. You were very, you were very playful. Uh, I know that there must have been a ton of pressure because I have felt that. I felt that I, if there, for myself, yes, but to feel yes like and I, no, no, Be, un, unlike my first season on Sesame Street, where I felt like every day was an audition and I, I couldn't blow this, right? Um, I, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I did feel that when I was rehearsing, but but when we were actually on set, I was, I was definitely, I was in the moment, and man, I was listening. You know, it's something about mm-hmm. improv and acting; you got to listen to whoever yeah. you're in the scene with, and I was blown away by what I heard, the choices uh, coming out of Amy and Jason yeah. in particular. Do you remember yeah. your best day? Yeah, 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 definitely. My des- best day was a scene, I think it was ultimately cut from the film, but it was uh. on Hollywood Boulevard. I was in a, a huge movie scene. They'd shut down Hollywood Boulevard. There's crowds of people on the outskirts. There's paparazzi everywhere. They, they, we've got a stunt man, a stunt coordinator. There's, there's, there's live cars. Even before the cars, I'm in a scene with Amy Adams, Jason Siegel, Rob Corddry, Mm-hmm. And my character, mm-hmm. <laughs> the only puppet in the scene, uh, and I've got, I've got a ton of lines, yeah. and and there's so many people around because it is a movie, and I was like, I kind of stepped out of myself for a moment at that moment. I'd never been in that situation before, and it is what I'd always wanted. Where, yeah, you know, I was just. I don't know. I had this this major character in a film, and we didn't know how the film was going to turn out. But but right. just that day, uh, that it was an incredible feeling. It was legitimizing. I'm I'm not. <laughs> I think most of us actors are not the most secure people. Uh, <laughs> right? No, we're not. And uh, that was just. Yeah, it was a good day. It was a really really good day. Yeah, it's nice yeah. when you can step outside for a minute. I mean, we spend so much time really inside our own head and watching the oh, monitor yeah. and looking at the characters and thinking about the, the lines and the character and scene partners and and so hard sometimes to kind of step out and go, "Oh wow, we have a really cool job." <laughs> this is this and yeah, you're, this you're, is your this is your childhood self steps outside for a second and you're like, "Dude, you're doing it." <laughs> I know. Oh I know. my god. Yeah. Uh, nicknames. nicknames. Remember, we had nicknames for all the Muppet performers yeah, on that film. Yeah, we did that at the Doheny we, Mansion. Yes, we which, did. Which I see in so many movies. Now. Yeah. Now the quick story is that we all decided one day because we were sitting around. For you, you, whatever. You have reason. a lot of downtime. Yeah. On, you have downtime in television, movie time. You know. Even more. Exponentially more downtime. Yeah. And we were deciding we needed to have nicknames. We were mm-hmm. going to pick people's nicknames for them. There yeah, were very specific rules. You couldn't pick your own. If yep. you did not like a nickname that we picked for you, well, that was going to be your nickname. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Even more so. That locked it in. <laughs> yeah, that locked it in. <laughs> so right. do you remember? I remember. Yes, I remember. Oh, I remember. I so, remember most of them. Okay, so Peter, you were Java. Java. Later, because of my kind of, love of coffee and espresso. Yes, you became the connoisseur later. But well, well, Dave Goles likes to call me the connoisseur. Yeah. Dave, but, uh, speaking of, was the sauce. The sauce. Uh, Dave is vegetarian and is all about sauce yes. on his food. So he's Steve, the sauce. Steve Whitmire was Big Cat. Yep. You are yeah. Mr. Sparky. Not just Sparky. Uh, that's right. Mr. Sparky. Mr. Sparky. Yes. I, uh, yeah. And our friend, yep, 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 <laughs> yep. It's yours, Mr. Yep. Sparky. Yep. And Eric Jacobson, of course. Psycho. Psycho. Yeah. Uh, David Rudman. 
Oh, new oh, Coke. New Coke. New Coke. Because he Coke. was in a New Coke commercial. He was in a New Coke commercial, right. <laughs> and I remember we tried so hard to find that New Coke commercial. You can't find it anywhere. We cannot find it. So if you the other have thing I tried new to find Coke David commercial. Rudman in the party scene in Risky Business because he's in uh, the background. Yeah. I think I found him, but he doesn't even remember it well enough to say whether that was him oh, or not. I sent man. him a still. Uh, Bill, uh, Bill Beretta was uh, Smooches or Smooch? Oh, Smooch. Yes, yeah, Smooch. He's always smooches. kissing people. Um, Alice Deneen was Dubois. Du- 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 Dubois. 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 Uh, Bruce Lenoil uh, was oh, rabies. Rabies. Uh, um, um, Nathan. Nathan yeah. Danforth. Yeah. yeah. Trike. Trike. Uh, and Paul McGinnis. Oh, it was Paul McGinnis. Paul McGinnis. Oh, oh, I just got it. I know what it is. Oh, it's Haas. McGinnis. Do you remember? Paul yeah. was Haas. Yeah, yeah. Paul was okay. Haas, for yeah, yeah. sure. Oh, man. So, I mean, so we had some fun on that movie. That was a blast. It, 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 eventually. For me, the first few weeks were tough. You know, Bill, once again, was holding my hand through mm-hmm. that. And he, he's, he doesn't take the credit for this, but he really did. Because that, that Michael Sarah voice ended up not sticking at all. Bill mm-hmm. was concerned that this, you know, this character is an adult, but doing that voice, the, the puppet itself looks young. And yeah. we do that voice, it kind of sounds young. Yeah. And he said, you know, Peter's got kind of a young sounding voice anyway. What if, what if we, we, and we were doing a table read, we're reading through the script. He said, why don't we go back, read one of these scenes and Peter just use your own voice. Right. Okay. I was terrified. <laughs> I was terrified. As the first time, oh. I was terrified. Well, we're so used to doing character voices with these and, puppets. They look it, so goofy sometimes. You have to put a ridiculous yeah, vocal to yeah. it. It doesn't work. And for do kind of a, voice. you know, at least growing up a little bit shy, you, the puppet can say anything. You can, it does not your own voice. You, right. you put an affectation onto it and it's not your own voice anymore. That was tough. So that was really, really, really tough. But, the, but any, everybody, I think, was like, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, exactly. That. They're like, yeah, that. That's it. Do that. <laughs> that's what you're going to so, do. So Bill kept me honest those first few weeks. He was sounding too young. Like, okay, okay. Because I was starting to like, how are you starting to do this? He's like, uh-huh. no, just dial just, it down. Just talk. Relax into it. Yeah. Uh, what was your feeling when the movie finally came out and it was so well received? Oh, my gosh. I was thrilled. I couldn't believe it. It didn't seem real. Yeah. It still doesn't. <laughs> some I know. I know, but it did really well. People and you received were amazing. It really well. You were. I talked about Bill being my my mentor during all that, and holding my hand those first few weeks to help find the character. You were nine times out of ten. You were my assist. You were you were doing right? Walter's arms and life's a happy song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You That's know, fun. You, you're you're doing <laughs> you're doing his hands when he's doing that. That now it's become a meme. When he's when he's just screaming and running yeah. and on that that steady cam shot. Oh yeah, that was so much fun. And, yeah, I, and, and then I got to return the favor in Muppets Most Wanted, and I got to assist you yeah, a bunch yeah. with Constantine, which was great. great. Which was great. So the song. You sang a song with uh, Jason Siegel in that I movie. It, it won an Oscar. Isn't that insane? You are singing on an Oscar award winning yeah. song. Yeah. And it was the one. And my only little bitterness about it is it's the one year at the Oscars where they did not perform the nominated songs. That's ridiculous. They you missed, missed Oscars. opportunity you Oscars. <laughs> and you have an Oscar? For your performance, I do have an Oscar for my. They, they misspelled my name though. Instead of you know Peter oh. Lynch, they spelled it Brett McKenzie. Oh, and and they shipped it to uh, to to Wellington uh, oh. in New Zealand. So, thanks to Brett's lovely wife, I've I've gotten to have my picture taken with it. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> and I've gotten to hold it. My kids have gotten to hold it. We've gotten to look at the misspelling of my name on it. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Is there anything that you want to see happen with Walter? Something that he's not done yet. I, I'd like to see him come into his own a little more. You know, it, it's, mm-hmm. with that film, it's so self-enclosed. And, and I didn't know that Walter was going to have a life beyond the movie. I think a lot of people, and I, I know there are people that kind of wish that were the case as well. Because um, he's, he's just a guy. He, you know, all the Muppets have some kind of quirky thing about him. Walter's quirky thing is he's a fan. He's an you but, know, uber fan. Man, that's um, a thing. I think that's a thing, though. I think it might be a thing. I'd like to see him come into his own. I'd, like, I'd love to see him. I mean, and, and from the fan point of view, you know, he could handle all the Muppets social yeah. media stuff i'd also like to play up a little more something that was we had early on with him that kind of went away and that was he was really accident prone <laughs> there's nothing funnier than a yeah. muppet getting hurt oh, i mean look at you know i boy I, <laughs> well beaker of course but uh, yeah yeah he's not a regular guy walter's a regular guy and to see him slam into something it makes it that much funnier, I think. Yeah, he's yeah. just a guy. He, he needs he needs a fault. You know, he's he's just such a nice guy. This, he's got to have something. Yeah. I also want to talk to you about one of the other characters that you now play for the Disney Muppets, Link Hogthrob. Hmm. I really feel like you connect with Link on this insane other level. It's so <laughs> funny to watch. 
I wish we did more with Link because he's such an oh, idiot, and I love how you such play an him. Idiot! I love him so much. So what I, is it? Boy, there's such. I love stupid characters who think they're brilliant. It's the best, isn't it? To play. Yeah, I, that's how I feel yeah. about Constantine. He is an idiot. Oh my gosh, he's an idiot. But he yeah. thinks he's so smart. Yeah. But it's so much fun that's to just like so play fun that. to play that. Uh, and that confidence. I love. I love Link as a kid. Um. Yeah. I. I, I wish that he would get to be used more and and also i'd like to get him out of his pigs from space uniform every now and then yeah, you know link, he's got link those... used to sing these ridiculous ballads <laughs> yeah. i would love to do that with him i i love yeah you know, I, I, I i do sing will. i dabble yeah and you uh, sing you know uh, probably the i mean obviously that one of the most thrilling fun things i've gotten to do with link was at the o2 when we did the live show in london oh, the live shows uh, were so the doctor fun. who the doctor who parody yeah, that was great um, so much fun to do those live so shows i hope we get to do them again someday i do too uh, I'm going to do something that Andrew Moriarty, Sesame Street writer and digital producer, he calls it felt and horn. I think it's like rose and thorn. So it's it's basically this. So it could be something that's happened within this last year or five years or your whole career, whatever it is. But what has felt like the happiest moment? In my and then, career. Yeah. And then I'm going to counter that with then what has felt, I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your career, um, what I has can do felt that. like the that. lowest, like where you, where you got the horns. Right. That's cute. Um I, I remember the moment that I was I was told that I got Walter. I know exactly where I was. I know who I was with, and I know what I did. Yeah, that was that was, that was the happiest moment. I I was at my sister in law's house. Uh, she was in the kitchen. My wife was sitting next to me on the sofa. I thought I had some inkling that the call was coming one way or another. I didn't know. I didn't right. know I had it. I was going to find out who one, got it one way or the other. Yeah. And I had been waiting for weeks. Um, it was not a quick decision. Yeah. And I screamed like a little girl, <laughs> threw myself back on the couch, kicked my legs 90 degrees straight up in the air. Marlena is sitting next to me on the couch, uh, puts her hands in and starts crying. Uh, she was so happy. And and Brigitte comes in and she, they're very German, very understated. What happened? Oh, great. <laughs> you just got a role that just got this, yeah. this, this role in this film. And uh, actually... And then, you know, we didn't know the movie was going to be about Walter. I'd seen the script and it wasn't really about Walter. And that, mm-hmm. that changed when we were actually doing our filming and actually in the when we went back and re, did reshoots. Right. That's when it really became at least the first half his story. Yeah. So that was the, would that, that be was the rose? The, the, that's the, the felt, I guess. The felt. When you felt the happiest. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other one yeah. is when you get the horns. What was the, what was Gosh, the biggest there's burn? So many of those. <laughs> there's, there's, seriously, there's been so many of those. I think the very worst one, um, I'll, I'll think of some others, I'm sure, after this, but something that scarred me deeply was my very first season on Sesame Street. I was so thrilled to be there. And after I'd been there for a little while, um, I had friends that would come to New York or that I knew in New York, and I'd bring them by the set or I'd let mm-hmm. them come visit, visit me on the set. Yeah. It'd been going on for a few weeks. Kevin Clash pulls me aside. Can I talk to you? Uh, yeah, you know, you, 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 you can't, you can't keep having all these visitors coming in. You, you can't keep having all these, and this is my first season. So I'm, oh, this is when I'm like so scared. I'm going to blow it, you know, and if it keeps happening, uh, we're not, we're not going to use you anymore. I, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I, you, you, I mean, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Oh, oh man, that hurts. And, and uh, yeah. Because you're thinking okay. you've let him down, you've done, you've I'm made thinking, a and I'm huge mistake, that the, and that the producers have been talking about it. Yeah, Kevin, everybody can knows. You talk to P- can you talk to Peter? Oh. Yeah, that's really bad. He's really it's really distracting. It's a small it's a small studio. Oh, uh oh, I was reeling from that. It took me it took me a while to get over that one. Okay, so now we're we're nearing the end, Peter, I promise. Now okay. I'm going to give you some rapid fire questions and just kind of like whatever you think of, what just your answer is your answer. Okay. You can always go back and change it if you want. Okay, are you ready? <laughs> okay. Hands on the buzzer. Yes. Here we go. What sesame or muppet character do you best identify with? Cookie Monster. What's the hardest part about being a puppeteer? Uh, uh, the s- scarcity of work. Oh, what's the easiest part about being a puppeteer? Uh, the 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 the, um, the recognition. I mean, we don't get a lot of recognition because yeah, we're puppeteers. But when you do, you know, it you feels nice. Face. But yeah. when we do, it feels nice, and that yeah, just, and it just comes and and you know we work in a vacuum. Sorry, I'm giving a long answer yeah. to wrap no, that's, thing. No, that's fine. But uh, but you know we we don't have studio audiences like I said and. And when you do get those, get that feedback from, and you see what a difference your career is making in people's lives. That's, Makes a difference. 
yeah, it makes a huge difference. And, and yet it doesn't feel like I'm doing that much. Right. And it, but it means so much. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, it absolutely. Means so much. I know exactly what you mean. Okay. What's your biggest strength as a puppeteer? Manipulation, for hands what, down. Okay, what is your biggest weakness? Acting. Acting and improv. I don't know about that. Okay, what's one of your favorite things about being a Sesame Street Muppet performer? Or a Muppet performer? What's your, one of your favorite I've things? It's what i always wanted. One of my favorite things is, uh, is the fans, is interacting with people, is when we're out of the studio, when we're doing a live show or an mm-hmm. interview or... Uh, any any time we get to interact with fans yeah. and, and and people okay. who know the work and love it, as well, that's one of my favorite that's things. Funny. If you weren't a puppeteer, now I know what your answer is going to be, but <laughs> if you weren't a puppeteer, what would be your career? I was sure I'd be doing the same thing I was doing when I was sixteen. I'd be bagging groceries. If I weren't a puppeteer, I don't know how yeah. I could make a living. Seriously, I'd I'd be. Uh, I you know what my wife, my late wife, used to say, and I love this, and I say it too. I have no marketable skills. <laughs> <laughs> I thought really, that's what you were going to say. I thought that was going to be the first thing out of your mouth. I was like, well, I can't. There's nothing else I can there's do. There's nothing else I, I can do. Nothing. I can bag groceries. I did that when I was 16. <laughs> yeah. I can tuck my hair into make a, well, make a little fake bun and work in men's formal wear. Yeah. I guess. Um, where is that formal wear? What's the name of the I place? I could deliver. Again? Boyd For, Brandt formal wear? Right. Of course. Uh, what's the best piece of advice that you've gotten during your career? That's what Kevin said to me after my very first workshop. There's two things. Uh-huh. There's two two best pieces of his advice. That's the first one yeah. about getting a monitor and I mean a camera that you can hook up to a monitor and practice right. the skills we've learned at these workshops. The second, mo- and this might even be the first, was someone told me when I was I was towards the end of college. It was a very successful guy. He was a father of a friend of mine, and he said that you know so many so many of the most successful people you ever hear about. One of their common answers about well, how did you get this was. Well, I was in the right place at the right time. Yeah. And for me, with Walter, with Sesame, with any any of my jobs I've gotten, I was in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Well, you have control over exactly 50% of that equation. And that was part of my rationale for me and my wife moving to New York when we did is that the work is there. And if this is going to happen for me, I got to put myself in the place. Hmm. And you put yourself in the place and you wait long enough hopefully the time will come around and you'll be in the right place at the right time, yeah. which I was and which I have been for every step of my career. Yeah. From Avenue Q, we didn't talk about. I know, um, I know. Yeah. I was going to say so many things we haven't even discussed. But uh, so yeah. the last thing here, Jerry Nelson said to me once, you know, Sesame Street's great, but always have something that is your own, mm-hmm. that you create, that is yours. And it could be, it could be whatever. It could be the small, tiniest little thing. But what is that for you, Peter? <laughs> It's not that I'm making a living on, but uh, it seems to be uh, what I do at Halloween every year with my house. Tell me about that. <laughs> I know about it, but some yeah, people don't. I live in this, this 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 beautiful old house. It was built in 1912, and it's kind of up on a hill, and it's on a dirt road. And the uh, people we bought it from told us that they used to do a little cemetery in the front yard for Halloween. And that kind of something clicked in my head. It captured my imagination. About a year later, my wife was looking at something in, in Martha Stewart living, and there was a, a thing about how to make your own headstones out of styrofoam insulation. And I was like, okay, all right, this is a thing. <laughs> and I started making this cemetery in my front yard. And uh, there's a lot of kids in the neighborhood. We're walking distance to the local elementary school and to the village. And um, and I, I, the first year we, we moved in, I asked my neighbor, Jean, how many trick-or-treaters should we expect? And she said, oh, 100, 150. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've always wanted to live somewhere where you actually had trick-or-treaters. <laughs> Growing up, we'd get three or four in my house, and I'd be so bummed. Uh, like, oh, man. I was, I was like, well, we have to do something. That's, 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 an, that's not – those aren't trick-or-treaters. That's an audience. Yeah. That's, <laughs> so you went all out. Well, it, it started slow, and uh, it, it evolved over time. I started with my little handmade headstones and some leaves and a little bit of lighting on the house and evolved into this thing where we get well over 2,000 trick-or-treaters every Halloween. When Halloween falls on a weekend, which it will this year, I mean, the last time Halloween was on a Saturday, we got over 3,000 trick-or-treaters. Oh and I only gosh. know because I know how much candy we give out. And 3,000 people. Yeah. And they go through the yard. There's a serpentine path through the yard. That, it's so uh, much fun. There's been a number of years we've had a live band. One of my neighbors across the street used to, he hired a band as well and had a couple of kegs. Another neighbor does up his house, uh, does a different theme every year. Not quite as elaborate, but but beautifully done. Uh, that's so much fun. And it's a quiet dirt road. We close it off to cars. It's just it's just a sea of humanity for four hours on Halloween night. Uh, well, that's it. it. That's your thing. Zoo. 
That's your and that, thing. And that appears to be that appears to yeah. be my thing. Well, Peter, thank you so much for talking with me. This has oh been gosh, awesome. Man. And I love you. You're one of my best friends and I'm so happy to be able to speak to you about I love you too, awesome. Maddie. And I this has been the most thorough interview I have ever given him in my life. And I'm losing my <laughs> voice from yakking so much oh, about geez. myself. But uh, Well, thank you for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Oh, always good to talk to my friend Peter. I love him. He's so awesome. And that's Below the Frame for today. You can connect with us online. Just search for Below the Frame on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Our show today was produced by me with editing assistance from Jared Fairclough and production assistance from Andrew Moriarty. Our theme song was written by Stephanie DeBruzzo and performed by The Mighty Weaklings. Our podcast artwork was created by Dave Holtine at DaveHoltineDesign.com. The award from our sponsor players today in the live hands ad were Tao Bennett, Spencer Lott, Chris Hay- Hayes, Haley Jenkins, and David Rudman. Thank you to Peter Linz, Fran Brill, David Rudman, and my son Jack for being a part of this episode. And thanks to you, the fans, for listening. I'm Matt Vogel, and we'll see you next time when we go below the frame. Bye-bye. Go, go, go below the frame.